I'd like to call the uh, October 30th school committee meeting to order. Uh, welcome, thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, tonight we'll, uh, we'll start with the consent agenda, excuse me, public input, the consent agenda. We'll have reports and then we'll have a uh, uh, FY18 capital uh, presentation by Joe Huggins and then we'll have the Eaton uh, uh, improvement plan presentation uh, followed by the uh, superintendent's goals. So is there any uh, public input for anything that's not on the agenda? Seeing none, thank you. Motion on yep. We'll move to approve the consent agenda. Does anybody have anything they'd like to remove? All those in second. Second. All those in favor? Five zero. <coughs> and now we'll have reports. Hi, Caitlin. How are you? Thanks, how are you? Good. Um, so this Saturday, the SAPs are at RMHS starting at 8 a.m. And then next weekend, November 10th, is the opening weekend of the RMHS Drama Club's production of Pippin. You can get your tickets on ticketstage.com. Get those soon. And that's all for today. Very good. Thank you. Are there any committee reports? <coughs> Yes. Just briefly, I was going to say I was at the CPAC workshop on, um, I'm losing track of time right now, but I think it was Thursday night, October 26th. Um, and there was a workshop on uh, parent training and from the parent training and info session center of the Federation for Children with Special Needs called an IEP for our chi my child. Um, it was a really informative presentation by Debbie Sharp, um, and she gave, she went everywhere from an overview to concrete suggestions, uh, like having a picture of your child with you, to how to do constructive ag advocacy, how to document your concerns, and how especially to work with your team. Um, and had suggestions about that, how to collect data, so that you can speak with your team in concrete ways. But it was a very informative workshop, and um, there were, I don't know, maybe 20 people there. So I thought it was a good showing for those meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Um, I wanted to make the committee, I think I've made the committee aware, but to make the broader public aware that uh, if you don't already know, Reading turns 375 next year, and a an group has formed in town to begin planning um, some really nice, fun events next year to celebrate this big anniversary of our community. And their first big fundraiser is on Friday, November 17th at 7 o'clock at RCTV Studios. It's going to be a trivia night. And I, it promises to be really fun. So I would just encourage everyone um, to check that out. Um, sure you can call RCTV to get details and there's an event price website uh, where you can order tickets so I'm sure they'll be doing more fun events but that one is coming up yes um, Dr. Dardy, are you or Mr. Martin going to do an, uh, anything on the parent university just a quick update okay I, yes I am Good. Okay. Any? yeah just two real quick things um, First, last week I had the pleasure of attending one of the challenge day sessions. I think it was last week. It seemed like a long time ago, but it was, I think, Monday's session. I know we had two sessions at each middle school. Um, I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, which was just a, I mean, as it is, always is, just a very moving um, and amazing event. The kids were absolutely amazing and role models, I think, for all of us. It just I just can't say enough. I would have to spend most of the evening, I think, talking about it. The facilitators that come each year, I mean, they're different people each year, but it's just amazing how they um, structure the day. Um, and to see the kids and adults connecting in a way that truly makes them understand each other. I think one of the themes of the day is sort of you know, if you really knew me a little bit better than just the way we appear on the surface, um, we treat everyone with respect and dignity. You know, they call it the, the iceberg, and then, you know, most of that iceberg is below the waterline, and that if in our interactions with people we can lower that waterline just a little, mm -hmm. depending on how, comfort, how comfortable we are with that, um, it really makes a difference. And the things that I heard the kids saying to each other and the way they were interacting was very powerful, and I think it's truly, truly a 
memorable event for them that will impact them for years to come. So I'm just pleased to get to be a part of that. It really is inspiring um, to learn from the kids, I think, that. Um, and also, of course, um, MCAS, I know we set out or sent out a message this weekend. I, um, we've been putting together the mailings because we did we have received the individual student scores. So parents should be expecting those sometime soon. And then, of course, next next week, I believe, at the school committee, we're going to yes. do a, a, a larger presentation on all of the district's scores, especially to give some understanding of this new next generation MCAS, as the state is calling it. That'll be next week. Yes. I'm not going to ask an MCOS question. I'll wait for that meeting. Um, but I do have a question on process. So yeah. the state sends us all of the individual score, scores to central office, and then we mail them out? Yes. Can I ask who does that actual work? And I have a follow-up question. Is I'm looking over at Linda. <laughs> <who's> <laughs> like, going to disappear. <laughs> Is that something, I mean, it would seem to me that if the state is responsible for administering the test, couldn't they send out the scores? That's the, I know that's the way it's been for ever, I believe. I don't think they it's don't have the individual yet. addresses and So you're doing like a check to make sure everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They will also say that it is in our chapter seventy money. Oh. All of that. <laughs> the work the work to distribute yeah. those. All of that extra so, yeah. chapter seventy money. Yep. So you <laughs> just, that sounds like an enormous amount of work. Thank you. Right. So you said they we have to provide the envelopes then because you just said they don't have the address. Envelopes, stamps, postage, not stamps, postage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The manpower to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm also, I will wait till the next session. I've got a couple things. I'm going to pass out our enrollment as of October 1st. Um, so as that's coming around, I'll give you a second to get that. I think um, we should be pretty pleased with what we're seeing at the elementary level for class sizes. Um, you can see for the most part we're within the guidelines that the school committee has, has held on to for several years now. Um, there is one, one place I do want to point out, um, it Barrow's grade five, so but currently we did have a teacher leave the day before school started and the two remaining teachers in grade five really wanted to not have bring in a long-term sub and they took the total of students and um, split them in half so the class sizes there right now are 27 and uh, 26 we are in the process of hiring a grade five teacher we are in the final stages of hiring a grade five teacher we should have that um, completed in the next few weeks so um, but I do want to uh, give a kudos to um, the two Barrows teachers they came to us with this proposal they they felt that it would be better that the kids had two teachers that had been part of the Barrows culture that understands the curriculum not to bring in a long-term sub which then would be changing to another teacher um, in in a month or two so um, I just want to want to just give a shout out for, the, for their work and so that is going to be resolved soon but the um, as you can see the rest of the class sizes are in pretty good shape when you flip it over to um, the, the big K to 12 picture um, the one area I just want to make the committee aware of which is going to probably become a budgetary issue when we're talking about FY19 budgets, if you notice grade 12 at the high school currently has 274 students. Um, when that grade leaves, we're gonna be getting a grade eight class that is going to be somewhere, um, it's gonna be much larger than the 274. Mm -hmm. The high school already is very tight because the majority of the cuts over the last two years for teachers have been at the high school. So the base budget is going to have to have some high school staffing um, to address that need because we would not be able to provide some of the courses with the current staffing that we have because we, we offered less sections in grade 12 this year because there were less kids. Next year we're not gonna have that luxury. 
Um, so I just want to make the committee, that's kind of like a pre-warning as we, when we start entering FY19, that that's something we're going to have to discuss. Wasn't the class that left uh, was large. Was a very large class. But remember, we made cuts. <clears throat> Over the last two years, we've cut seven FTE at the high school. Yes. Any questions on enrollment? Well, yeah, I just wondered the Parker and Coolidge class sizes. I know we don't have really specific guidance that we try to keep. I think it was 22 or lower in the elementary school, so I understand why you did the breakout you did. But is there any significant increase in any of these classes? They're pretty big, right, to overall 360 to 326. Um, um, what are the class size? Give us a sense of the class sizes across the elementary school or the middle schools, I'm sorry. So the easiest way to do this is you take the total number at Coolidge and divide each grade by six, because they have six groups in each grade. Okay. At Parker, you divide by eight. They are the larger of the two schools. Grade six at Coolidge is larger. Um, I believe they're at 28, 29-ish mm -hmm. in that area. Um, and it's more, it's a bubble because of, of the redistricting, of the district lines that we have for middle schools. There really wasn't a lot we could do. We do offer the ability for students to attend the opposite middle school that they're districted in, but um, we didn't have enough that would have balanced the classes differently. So parents can pick which middle school? Is it how no, no, we give, we, no, no, they, there's district lines for the middle schools. Understood. Um, but we do, with the incoming sixth grade each year, we tell the fifth grade parents that if you want to, we have a whole process that the school committee approved years ago, right. that if you want to attend the opposite middle school, um, there's a whole process. So if we get 10 students from Parker mm -hmm. that want to attend Coolidge and 10 students from Coolidge, then it's just an even swap. We try, the, the goal is to balance class sizes as much as possible. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Dr. Doherty, do you know, I know every year we experience a certain attrition from eighth grade to ninth, like that's just naturally part of the process. Do yeah. you have any sense of what that typically runs Usually around 8%. 8%. Around 8%. Yeah, it's been the average. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> Do we know if it changed last year, that attrition? I honestly don't know that off the top of my head. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if that, if that holds here, you'd be right around 300. And so you're losing a class of 274 and putting it, say, about 25 extra kids. 25 kids, yeah. Okay. okay, I do have a few other things. Yeah. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about Parent University. Um, next Monday night, Sandy Calandrella will come and do a more extensive report um, on Parent University. But I just, you know, I just want to say that this was a very positive experience um, for our community and for our parents. Um, Sandy and her staff put a tremendous amount of time um, putting this together. We did receive a grant from Reading Cooperative Bank, which paid for the entire event, so there were no operating funds used for this event at all. Uh, really, the goals of the Parent University was um, to provide a way for us to give parents an opportunity to be educated on important topics, to create those stronger relationships uh, with parent teachers, students, and the wider community, and to give parents more information and confidence about their child's academic programs. Um, we began with a keynote by Dr. David Walsh and his daughter Erin, um, who uh, both have speak across the country on, on a variety of uh, issues involving students. Um, and then after that, they did two workshop sessions. Um, we also had sessions on digital age and int intentional parenting, uh, the youth risk behavior survey results, middle school transition, middle school advisory, anxiety in elementary age children, uh, school budget 101, and raising hardy and resilient children and youth. Um, we got very positive responses from all of the people who responded to the evaluation, and Sandy will go into that in more detail um, on, on Monday night. So I just, wanna, I just wanna do a shout out for Sandy Calandrella and Rich Belmonte, Anne Marie Johnson and Vivian Tringali, and they're the ones that 
really put this whole thing together. Um, and we do plan on doing it um, annually, so we'll about the same time next year. Um, I also want to talk about a couple other things. Um, Killam Elementary School won a $100 award for a poetry project. They were one of the top 10 schools in the nation for contributing authors for poetry in grades uh, two through five, and as a result, um, they received a $100 award. So congratulations to Killam. Um, this week at our middle schools, this Thursday, um, Chad Hymas uh, is coming to present uh, in the morning at Parker and in the afternoon at Coolidge. Uh, this is uh, due to the generosity of understanding disabilities. Uh, I had the opportunity to hear Mr. Hymas this summer um, at our superintendent's conference. And so his, his life changed instantaneously when a falling one-ton bale of hay broke his neck when he was um, in 2001, and he was a quadriplegic. So he goes around <coughs> to all of the country now um, and just talks about his dreams, um, the different types of, of ways that he inspires his audience. He's going to share his powerful message of dealing with peer pressure, how to build and maintain self-esteem, and how to set achieve goals and stay positive around negative people. So those are the messages that he's going to be giving on Thursday. So if you are available on Thursday, um, feel free to come to either Coolidge or to Parker. So the Coolidge one, I believe, is at 8 o'clock, Ricky? The Parker, the Parker one's at 8 o'clock. I mean, the Parker one's at 8 and the Coolidge one, I believe, is at 1.15. You will not be disappointed. He's very inspirational. I also do want to put a plug out for uh, budget liaisons. Um, we are asking to, um, to have budget liaisons for the FY19 budget process. Uh, we're doing things a little bit differently this year. We're no longer calling them budget parents because we also want to involve community members who may no longer, either may not have children or may no longer have children in the, in the Reading Public Schools. Um, so we're hoping to cast a wider net of people so that they can get a better understanding of our budget process and, and the budget. So all of the details has been, have been sent out. It actually was also in the, in the Chronicle uh, last week. Um, the deadline to submit is November 1st, and we're going to be starting to meet with them in mid-November. Um, and I believe that is everything I have. But in terms of getting that message out to the community, I would say use the Chronicle, but is, it, is there something then on the town website that's a link to the schools or? Um, I'm not aware of that. Okay. When did you say that deadline was? Wednesday. But we've, we've had this out for three weeks now. Mm -hmm. We've sent it out. It's been going out for about three weeks now. Mm -hmm. I know I saw it. It's been in newsletters. It's, it's been in my blog. Town, it's been in town meeting members know about it. <clears throat> we sent it to the the media to send out. So we don't. I mean, I can send out to the school community, which is what I've done a few times. Okay. That's it. Great. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Huggins. to the front. Included in the school committee packet is a memo summarizing the FY18 capital plan. As we discussed on September 25th, the capital plan is being recommended to be revised to include the $480,000 for the Wood End Skylight Project. So we invited Mr. Huggins here tonight to walk through the status of the plan what the goal is for the current year, and then after he gives the update, we are going to ask the school committee to officially approve the amended capital plan in advance of the town meeting vote that will happen in November. Thanks, Gail. So this year, <clears throat> excuse me, for FY18, we had um, $84,000 for carpet and flooring replacements at the uh, schools specifically Barrows, Killam, Parker, and Reading Memorial High School. We've completed work at the Killam, uh, doing some new classroom carpeting over there, as well as some inlay walk-off mats in six different locations over at that building, as well as the Parker Middle School. We did some classroom carpeting over at Parker. 
our plans, um, because these projects are a little trickier, is to do Barrows, the media center, over Christmas vacation, uh, where we're going to have to move quite a bit of furniture to make that happen, as well as some work here at the High School Performing Arts Center in the rear. Actually, it's all the carpet areas in the back and then up top that have shown quite a bit of wear to get that completed. Again, this is just school side capital that you're looking at. That's what we had this FY18. Our goal is to always get it wrapped up before, obviously, the close of the fiscal year. So we're on target to do that. Um, and in addition to that, we uh, are requesting um, $480,000 to replace the skylights at the Wood End Elementary School. Um, we've engaged an architectural firm to uh, begin design work. We did that shortly thereafter the um, 925 meeting um, to put together a bid package. If it's approved the town meeting, we will have a bid package ready to go out in the street and competitively bid it on the Chapter 149 um, bid laws and get that work done this summer at the wood end. The plan is to replace it over the summer, the skylight systems up there. And just as a quick reminder to folks is that the capital plan is outside of our operating budget. That historically, the town manager aims to put approximately 5% of the total town budget towards capital. So this is coming out of the capital budget, not the operating budget. I know that we oftentimes get asked questions on that. So that is a separate part. And just to let people know is for the school committee members we did include a copy of the warrant for the upcoming November meeting which does outline the capital plan as well as the addition of the 480,000 for the skylight so everything between this memo and the package all hangs together just so you would have it to see how it factors into the overall capital plan. Yes. I'm wondering if maybe Ms. Tarkins can review a little bit about the skylights, because I know there's been previous meetings and mm -hmm. discussions about what is the situation with the skylights, mm -hmm. why they're needed, mm -hmm. and really, I think, the in-depth evaluation that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you could maybe just recap that. Yeah, so we do um, periodic roof inspections of all of our buildings, um, and also we hire consultants to come out to verify what we know the conditions of the roof systems are at the various town and school buildings. On one of our um, roof surveys, we were up on the uh, roof at the wood end, and we noticed the cracking in the polycarbonate um, skylights, which are a one-piece unit that's actually structural, um, and it bridges each side of the, of the roof. Um, we noticed cracking. We noticed also there was um, some um, moisture uh, being created in between the glass so that the seal was broken. Um, we had an architect look at it. Um, their, their recommendation to us is to replace them sooner than later uh, and to keep any kind of heavy snow load off of the skylights. So last winter, we um, obviously, every, any time we got more than three or four inches of snow, we were up there, the guys were clearing snow off the skylights. The system that was designed and put on the roof of that building, has um, they've gone in a different direction now. They use more of a modular system that works better with the uh, wood timber building that the wood end is because that building does move a lot under snow load and it, the, way it, the way it's meant to deflect the load of the building. The new system will have replaceable panels. It will actually be hinged so that it'll, it'll flex. The system that's up there right now does not allow for that and that's the reason, part of the reason these crack. This is something that they've been using for years on buildings, the old system. Mm -hmm. And they found over time that they don't perform as well in New England. Um, due to the, you know, uh, the UV exposure and the fact that you do a lot of snow load uh, in the climate up here. Mm -hmm. So the new system will be uh, a hinged modular system. Um, it'll, um, it'll definitely be something that we can service. There's a greater serviceability going with something like this. It's similar to what we have here at the high school and at Barrows, so that you can replace gasketing material and you can replace panels if they, if they do happen to fail. So. The, um, the cost estimate was developed by an architect uh, locally who gave us that budgetary number, which includes the design, the construction, the OPM, the demolition, everything. Mm -hmm. So we feel like the number is, is good. Hopefully okay. when we bid it out, we'll get, it's competitive and we come in less and manage the project well. We can, um, maybe we don't need that whole 480000 but we feel like the estimate is good. So that, that always drives me crazy. Uh, I mean, if I were going to 
say as an example, I'm going to paint my house, and every painter that shows up, I tell them I have twenty-five thousand dollars to spend. They're not going to come in less than you know. 20. I mean, it's just why do we put the number out there when we're trying to get competitive bids? Uh, well, we need to put a placeholder in the capital plan for us to be able to, to, get, it to get it approved. So oh, I understand FYP. that, but. Uh, the various components of the plan will not, not be yet. disclosed, so we have it broken down by the various stages of it. Just the total amount would be out there as part of the town meeting process, but not the individual components that would comprise it. Yeah. Um, so um, there was some discussion previously as this topic came up about sort of asking what, you know, do we really need to do this now? I think there was a lot of confusion that people had with respect to um, thinking that this is money, this, that, that for capital, that could be used for operating. And so um, it cannot. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mr. Huggins came to us some months ago um, with this information based mm -hmm. on your survey. But I, I think just in terms of, uh, you know, looking at do we need to do this now or can we wait? Because people are just, you know, we're in a fiscal crisis and so people were asking, can we wait? And I think the answer was, you know, no, we really, we already spent last winter shoveling mm -hmm. snow and being really mm -hmm. diligent about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we would prefer not to have folks up there shoveling the snow. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we, you know, we have to go through another winter. We don't want to go through yet another winter, you know, the winter of uh, 2019 while we wait for this work to be done. So I think that it's really important to understand that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Emphasize that. What, are you, what are your expectations about two things? One is the time frame for completing the project from the time you put it out to bid, you know, is this a one or two months to install? And then secondly, when, once you have the system installed, the replacement system, you know, lifetime of, of that replacement so based on the if other we get the have. If we get the bid package, the design done in, say, early December uh, and go out to bid in January um, and make an award sometime end of February, beginning of March, it's a 10-week lead time usually on this type of thing, so that puts us um, June. Um, we should be able to get this done. It's a, probably around a four- to five-week process to do this, to get this completely done over the summer. Um, we would have to make arrangements with the school department, obviously, to you know divert any summer programs that might, might or might not have been happening at the, at the school. It wouldn't shut the building down from doing uh, normal maintenance work, but clearly while they're working in specific areas over there, we'd have to keep you know, people out of the, uh, you know, we'd have to allow a staging area for the contractor, things of that nature. Which is why we would target to do it after school gets out and before the right. school year starts to minimize mm -hmm. the disruption. And uh, so we've been through one winter with a defective mm -hmm. roof. This will be a second winter. Mm -hmm. You'll have to send people up to shovel. We go up on roofs all the time. Um, we were up. We were on roofs this morning. I was up on some of the roofs this morning myself. And it's just what we do. We have to. And we wouldn't have found this if we weren't inspecting the roofs. So that's the other thing to keep in mind. If you're not up there looking at the, the conditions, then you, we wouldn't have seen this. So that's a good thing in a lot of ways because we're watching what's going on. We had spotted some issues with uh, some um, some sheathing on the roof. Actually, was uh, some nails had popped, and we had some shingles that were you could see from the street lifting shingles. And we got up there to inspect them on cl closer inspection. We saw the issue with the skylight. So we do roof inspections all the time, um, just to make sure that we're um, not going to run into any issues. We're going to have roof leaks. You have them on brand new buildings. It happens. You just got to stay on top of them to eliminate you know, larger um, issues down the road. And, stay, and our roofs are in good shape. We just had a consultant come through um, to verify some information um, for some roof projects at Birch Meadow, Coolidge, and Parker. And the roofs are in good shape. They, they need, you know, there are some areas that we've identified that need some work, which we will be able to address, but the goal is to stay on top of them so you don't have something that's failing all at once and that you can, you know, maintain it, so. So does are you useful. No, the other question before that I asked was the lifetime of the replacement system. What, what do you expect to get? I'm not sure what the warranty usually is. With the new system, it's around a 20-year warranty, 20 to 25-year warranty. I can find that out for you folks. It'll all be spelled out in the specifications. 
that what we're going to be getting, the warranty. Um, we would be careful not to go with a, any kind of proprietary spec or anything like that, but go with something that can be serviced by just about anybody. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. So you're not stuck with one vendor having to work on it. So, so is the, are you all set? Sorry. Go ahead. Is the, is the architect or the, one of the principal negotiators in this process or is, who's doing the negotiation with the, with the, that's bringing the bids in? So what will happen is we'll bid it out through the procurement office on the town side because it's centralized procurement. So we'll bid it out under Chapter 149, which is public construction. We'll, we'll, get, we'll collect all the bids. And depending on what we go with, whether it's an IFB or an RFP, um, which is a qualification-based type of contract, you know, because it's over, oh, it's over 100, it's going to be over $100,000. Mm -hmm. um, the bids will be evaluated by myself and the assistant director. Um, and we'll have input from the school department also on the, on the company we choose. And we check references and things like that. So we vet it out pretty well. I just wonder whether the, I don't know the, the laws with that bid process, but if there's any way you can build some type of incentive in to, to the people that set the 480000 if it comes below that, and get a percentage of the savings. So there's incentive for them to come in better than four eighty. Because I just think it's out there now. Mm -hmm. Well, we've done, we've put other placeholders in for other um, projects and don't necessarily always spend the full amount that's in the capital plan. Just so you guys are aware of that on, on specific bids. We put them out to bid. There's a placeholder in and you have someone come in and they'll give you, if it's $1,000, they'll come in with $999. People do, you know, but they have to be able to back up what they're giving you. And you have to look at what they're, uh, offering you for a product and for you know a deadline and those are things we can put in there um, you know you, you want to make sure that you're getting the product you're paying for and that they're meeting the milestones in the in the project too so but it would be managed out of our office okay. yes. One question. so the um, on the warrant though only the 480 is in article 3 and that related to the school Piece. Right. The, so the other the other pieces were either already in there. They're not correct. part of the amendment. The other, so the hundred thousand and the eighty four thousand. Those were approved last year as part of the regular town meeting budget process. Okay. So the only part mm -hmm. going forward to town meeting is the four eighty yeah. amendment to the capital plan. Okay. Th that's why you're voting on the. It's a change. That's why yeah, you're voting so on it now. Just sorry, last two questions. The mm -hmm. person that the architect that did this 480 yesterday, I just want to make sure that you're comfortable that the source of that estimate, because it's going to be important that we don't go over that, right, either, that this is realistic. Mm -hmm. um, but without getting into the details, just within your expertise, the person that gave you that estimate, have they done similar estimates for similar projects, either within Reading They've done or similar districts? estimates for similar projects, and they've done other work for us here in the town of Reading, and we've had good success with. Um, with them drawing, drawing up both cost estimates and doing specifications for us. Okay. And they do a lot of municipal work, I should mention, also. So. Okay. And if we do nothing, it, get wor it gets worse? Yeah, I, would, I guess we're just doing this out of an abundance of caution, okay. for lack of a better word. I mean, just because it's just, um, it's, you, we've seen it, we know it's an issue, and we want to handle it, get it done. Were there... Were there any were there any actual like leaks failures from any of the cracks or just they're not in, leaking it's just not leaking, it, but it's in just between moisture the yes two layers right Correct. so you you've got some some compromise there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me read the yeah. motion move to approve the FY 2018 capital plan as revised and amended as it relates to schools a second a second any other discussion Five zero. Joe, I just had another quite totally unrelated. Mm -hmm. How I haven't heard good or bad. How are the modules working out? Uh, the modules are working out good. We added on um, roofs on the modulars. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. We put we put uh, roofs over them. They this, they had they had um, like a um, a deck with r ramps coming off both sides. And I believe it was not last year, but the year it was before. Two, yeah, it was two years ago. It was two years ago. We added uh, roofs on them so that basically when the kids are coming out, yeah. they, you know, they're not in the weather completely. Um, we've had, you know, the normal stuff. And the company that, that installed, installed them and supplied the modulus to us has, has been great. Um, so we have, you know, 
the normal wear and tear items, I, I, I think they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. I mean, then we've had a few AC issues that we've taken care of, but nothing out of the ordinary that you wouldn't expect, but the kind of use they're getting. And you're getting good response from the company in general? Yeah, during the warranty period, we were getting good response from them, and um, we had some issues with some of the site work that was done around the modulars, and they came right out, came back out and took care of it. So we had a good, a good experience. Thank you for managing that. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Joshua. Yes, so at this point, um, I'm going to have Lisa Marie Ippolito, our new principal at Joshua Eaton, is going to do her first update of the Joshua Eaton School Improvement Plan. Um, the presentation is in your packet. Um, I know that Lisa Marie is and her staff have been working, and the parents have been working very hard um, on this plan and the implementation of this plan. So I'm going to turn it over to her and get this discussion going. Well, I wanted to say thank you very much for having me this evening. It's my pleasure to talk about Joshua Eaton. I just want to kind of say it again out of the way that I just feel so blessed to be the principal of Joshua Eaton. This community has been so warm and welcoming from the families to the staff and especially the children. And I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity. Um, if you'll indulge me for a minute, I just want to um, introduce my staff that came out this evening Great. Um, to support. So we have Karen Girardi, our elementary librarian at Joshua Eaton, and Michelle Callen, grade four, Jamie Quinn, grade two, Sandy Emery, grade four, Bethany Nazaro, grade four, Kathleen and Jimmy, grade one, Donald Cook, our new third grade teacher, Phyllis Green, our new bridge teacher for grades two and three, I don't use, you all know Ricky, but Ricky's my mentor, so I hope it's Ricky. And then in the background here, we have Carolyn Boucher, who's bridge grade four or five. Pam Doyle, who's a new addition to Joshua Eaton for the Learning Center. Allison Ockerbloom, Title I coordinator. Uh, Ann Mana, kindergarten teacher. And then I'm also very blessed because I have my co-chair for the school council, uh, Christine Lusk, and another school council member, Erin uh, Gaffin, who's also going to be our budget liaison. And always Mrs. Downing, who's <laughs> super supportive and helpful um, with lots of data, Joshua Eaton. So thank you for having us. Um, I feel it important to say a very big thank you to Dr. Doherty. Um, we meet on a bi-weekly basis, and he is extremely helpful with supporting and guiding and having real um, explicit conversations about things going on at Joshua Eaton. So I want to make sure I say thank you, as well to the entire administrative team. Um, everyone reaches out and, and again is extremely supportive. Um, to start the school year, you know, we started off running. I had the opportunity to integrate into Joshua Eaton starting about uh, late April, um, prior to my contract beginning in July, and I felt like that was a huge blessing as well. So I got to work with Mr. Sprung and um, the staff, and we did meet and greets, so I got to know them. Um, and Amy Greco, who is my secretary, uh, was super supportive this summer with communication with parents, because we wanted to start off on the right foot uh, with open communication and so that the parents could learn um, my style. Is, I, I love to have that two-way back and forth. Um, the facilities department, uh, we had Joe Lab, Joe and Kevin Gabusi and Kevin Gersner, I mean, they came in toward the building with me, answered questions. Um, and comments that I received about the building, um, which are kudos to Dino and John, our custodians, is that the building has never looked so good. So we were very, very proud to start the year that way. Um, and then also this summer I met with our PTO presidents, um, our co-chairs, so Christine, um, I'm sorry, Katrina Madden and Colleen Terrell, uh, as well as the executive board, and of course Christine, who um, is kind of like my right hand in communication with parents. Um, a fun activity that we did the night before school started was a back-to-school evening where for an hour I invited um, parents to come with their children the night before school started so we could get rid of those first day jitters. So kids came, they toured their classroom, they saw where their desk was, they brought supplies if they needed to, um, and we got a lot of positive feedback from families for that evening. So it was a great start to the school year. Um, our philosophy is a whole child approach and basically all the po policies and practices and relationships ensure that, children, that ch each child is healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. 
and that ties directly into our um, vision statement that we um, is the same one from last year. And I think it's important the Joshua Eaton Elementary School is committed to developing a community of learners that are respectful of each other, our school culture, and our learning abilities, supportive of social, emotional, and physical needs, and prepared to make a positive contribution to our school and the Reading community. The Joshua Eaton Elementary School fosters an environment that provides students with skills required to work hard every day and achieve individual learning goals. And I think this is evident as you walk through our school building, um, and we have had many students who participated on their own in community building skills. Um, so we're very, we're very proud to support students with that. So jumping into um, the school improvement plan, uh, the first area that uh, we are going to be looking at is literacy. So to continue to improve students' performance in English language arts by full adoption of Reader's Writer's Workshop. And these aren't all the action steps, because um, there's many. <laughs> But these are just a, a few. So providing our staff with professional development um, so that we have consistency in instruction. Uh, staff meetings to collaborate and calibrate instructional practices. So during our staff meeting time, um, it's not kind of me standing in front of them just feeding them information. It's a collaborative approach where we use protocols and we talk about the practices within our classroom. Data meetings with grade level teams, and this year we're moving away from the spellathon into a readathon to tie into um, our literacy goal. Um, and we hope to culminate the readathon with Read Across America, which is I think March 2nd this year. So we're trying to like weave and tie um, everything together so there's consistency. Uh, another goal for student achievement is communication. We're carrying this goal over from last year's school improvement plan um, and bringing it kind of to the next level. So improve communication among students, <coughs> parents, staff, and community. They'll increase communication to focus on learning and facilitate more effective instruction accountability. So a couple of ways that we're doing that is we're continuing with those that fabulous Joshua Eaton tracks. Um, and that is our main mode of communication to our families. So even when I want to say something to families, I put it in the tracks. So parents know that's the go-to place um, to look for information. Uh, we have created a PTO bulletin board, which is right when you walk in the door of Josh Eden on the Oak Street side. And that has a bulletin board and a calendar. So as parents come in, they can really just get a bird's eye view of the month um, and all the activities going on at school. We have Facebook and Twitter updates. Um, Mr. Cross, who's our MECO director, has begun doing diversity lessons during the open circle time um, with our students. Um, I have established a parent cafe, so prior to PTO meetings, I hold um, a Q&A session and I try to have a guest speaker as well. It's like an hour long. And so in September, we had uh, Kathy Santilli come and she supported parents in learning how to use the portal so that they could get information from the staff easier. They could see their student's report card. Um, so we provided that training. And then coming up um, at our next Parent Cafe, uh, Alison Ockabloom is going to come and she's going to talk about Title I. Um, and in the past, I've also talked about the Fondas and Pinnell levels and supported parents with what does that actually mean. <coughs> and so there will be topics, um, relevant topics like that that we will discuss. Um, many of our classrooms are using Classroom Dojo. And they, basically, it's a um, program where you can use your iPhone or any piece of technology, actually, to report to parents how students are doing in the moment of that day during a lesson. So parents all day long are getting reports like the children earn points for positive behavior. Um, and it's just really a nice tool um, of communication back and forth with families. Our classroom teachers have amazing newsletters. They share those with me on a weekly basis. Some teachers send home a paper copy. Some teachers put the newsletter within the portal for parents, and some teachers do both. But we are um, um, trying to achieve our goal of a weekly newsletter for every family from our classrooms. And then I um, have begun using what's called a s'more staff newsletter, and that's just kind of a picture of one copy right there. And in that newsletter is kind of the things that um, in the past would typically be stated during a staff meeting, but instead I'd rather do it in this format. And also, um, this enables me to embed professional development for the staff. So for example, this week I embedded an article about gratitude. We have um, 
one of the dads in our community coming and he's going to do an assembly with our students about gratitude and so to help support build the capacity of our teachers and have everyone use the same language um, I put a blog about gratitude and then you can also embed videos so each week I've been embedding a video about readers workshop so one week was about the mini lesson the next week it was about conferring the next week um, it was about small group instruction and so it's just these quick quick hits um, to support our staff and calibrate um, the work that we do every day with kids. Um, our third goal is around student um, attendance. Um, and looking at the attendance data, our goal for the 17-18 school year is to improve students' daily attendance as evident by a 10% decrease in the number of students absent for more than 10 days in a school year and to create and to increase all students' um, attendance in school every day. So some action steps, um, I was able to attend professional development put on by the Matula's um, Partnership for Youth. Um, it was very informative to hear about all the resources available to school districts to support um, families and students around the issue of attendance. Um, working with our SRO, Officer Lewis, um, he and I have conversations about our more severe cases and what we can do to support families. Uh, weekly attendance percentage posted in the tracks. That is a future step that we would like to do. We would like a goal of 98% attendance weekly um, and um, have some kind of fun activity with the students to engage them and have them uh, want to come to school and kind of figure out what are the reasons why they're not coming to school. Um, support families around health, social, emotional needs. And the, um, this district is wonderful. We have so many resources, including the interface referral service um, for those families that, that may need that, that assistance and help. And for example, some communications that I've already had with some, with some families, it comes down to maybe a student needs to take medication in the morning and they need to eat first and they're having a hard time with that. So we've made arrangements that the student will come to school, eat a little something, and then our school nurse will administer the medication. And that, for that student, relieved absences and tardies. So these are the kinds of things we're looking to do. We're trying to make sure that this isn't coming across as punitive at all towards our families or to our students, but as help, right? Like what, what is happening? Um, what support can we provide to you um, so the students are coming to school? Um, we're making deeper connection with the students at Eaton um, to let them know they're missed when they're not at school with us. Um, also, after three consecutive absences, um, I call home just to check in just to see if families need help. Um, and then after five absences, um, a letter will go home, just letting parents know. Um, this piece, of, one piece of data here, talks about the, um, all of the elementary schools and students last year with 10 or more absences. And as you can see, Joshua Eaton kind of stands out in most, uh, God bless you, every area, especially absent 10 or more days with 24 point seven. Um, so we are looking to decrease those numbers for sure because as you'll hear about as we start looking at some other data that when students aren't at school it, it, um, they're not learning and our student achievement gap increases. So just some other data points. The average number of days absent by grade um, and in most of those categories you can see that um, our students are struggling a little bit. It's interesting to have conversations about this data, um, and parents have been pretty brutally honest, and they'll say, well, we thought it was kindergarten, and Disney was, it was a great time to go to Disney. And that's great, but it's having the conversation about, well, maybe that wouldn't be the, the best idea. Um, and then this uh, chart here is talking about percent of chronically absent. And so for Joshua Eaton at the kindergarten level from last year, these are our current first graders, um, the number is a little bit jarring with the 8.1% um, uh, of our students chronically absent missing uh, 10 or more days. So these are just some data points that to us we want to dig deeper and figure out the, what do these numbers actually mean. Um, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is special education. So um, when talking about special education, we have worked really hard to start the year um, talking about timelines. Timelines in terms of um, 
when there are three year reevals or annual reviews. So we have calendared out all of those dates and scheduled those meetings for the school year already. Um, we have also, uh, the special ed staff has submitted their personal schedules to me way back in September to make sure that we were providing the service delivery required on every IEP. And we actually took it to the next level where we have in our office individual student schedules. So that way it helps us to uh, track students and if a service is missed, the teachers come and they highlight um, the service that is missed so that we are tracking um, to be sure that there aren't excessive services missed. In the teacher's schedules, they have also um, created blocks for testing and for IEP meetings, and so services for our students are not being missed for, for um, those necessary um, meetings. Also, our special education department has done an excellent job with our general education staff um, having collaboration meetings. I'm not going to say that we're 100% on that, but it's something we are building towards, it's a goal of ours that the general ed uh, teachers and special ed staff are meeting together to collaborate about what is being taught in the classroom, what modifications need to be made for our students so that they can all be successful. Um, and also, we have established this year a common meeting time for all special ed staff as a department where our team chair, Amy Benjamin, actually runs the meeting and we talk about policy and processes and questions and professional development. Um, just to make sure that um, we are in sync and everything is consistent. Talk a little bit about our bridge program. Um, I know I've obviously have been here for several meetings about the bridge program. All of, I want to say that this is a new year and a new start and that this program is very different than from what I've heard it was in the past. For us, this program um, um, we believe is a high functioning program where students are getting what they need, whether it is specialized reading instruction from um, um, Mrs. Boucher or uh, Mrs. Green, who are either Wilson or Orton Gillingham certified and trained. And actually, Mrs. Green is also going to become LIPS trained and certified. Um, so, we are offering students the tools they need to be successful within our bridge program. We also are looking at kids very individually. We are finding that some of our students, for example, may be really strong in math. And so instead of why are we holding them back um, in a sub-separate setting when they can be successful in the general ed with support, whether it be a para or the special education teacher themselves. And so we've been having those conversations with the current parents in the bridge program um, to provide students with a free and appropriate education in a least restrictive environment. Um, and we're very, very proud of that. This summer, we also had an open house and invited all the parents um, and children who are part of the bridge program. And we feel, we, I think we had maybe 75% um, of the students and parents show up. And we felt it was very successful. And we took a little survey and answered questions because we knew there was some fear going into the school year about what is this bridge program going to be all about. Um, and then to continue with special education, um, in terms of professional development, um, Mr. Martin has been very, very helpful um, that we have a um, co-teaching book group where we have 14 staff members and myself who are doing a book study on co-teaching co -teaching, uh, and working to, um, together to define what that model may look like at Joshua Eaton um, in the future. And then there were several of us, there were, it was interesting how it happened. There happened to be two dyslexia conferences on the same exact day. So um, groups of us went to each of those conferences and one was on math and dyslexia and the other was um, a general brain study, um, more pick as you will, uh, workshop model. So other things going on at Joshua Eaton include enrichment and community building. We are going to have two different uh, guest authors so David Rottenberg is coming um, this week, and it's a ballet um, presentation. And then Max Brailler um, is coming February 15th and 16th. And uh, if you're not familiar, he's an author who his books are actually about Joshua Eaton. So um, in a very kind of like almost, I want to say comic book style, but sort of that style. So we're very excited for those opportunities for our students. We have also been working, again, very closely with Understanding Disabilities. A group of us volunteered to do the jail and bail. We had a great time with that. We were told we were kind of the loudest group there, but <laughs> we hope we raised some good funds for a worthy cause. 
And um, they've been working with each grade level, and I know we had um, Molly Spinney who came in last week uh, to talk with our fourth graders. So just a great, another great opportunity for the students at Joshua Eaton. We also are privileged to have the Mystic Valley Elder Services. Um, and so we're up to three readers who come um, during the week, and their focus is on K-2, and they come, and they just read with kids, and they confer with kids, and it's just another uh, pair of hands uh, to support our students, and the kids love it, and the teachers love it. Uh, community readers, which you all know about, I invited everyone here to come join us, and so we're trying to um, um, bring as many community members as we can into our schools so kids can recognize you on the street and also see that everybody loves to read. Um, and research shows that when students are read to or read with, their comprehension and their achievement grows. So um, I am, we're hoping you all can come and attend. And we have uh, Chief Burns who's coming and Dr. Doherty and basically that whole side of the room over there um, coming to join us. Um, and so we're very excited and the kids get thrilled when they see a guest reader come into our schools. Um, the PTO, we just had our, my first experience with the Halloween Howl on Friday. Uh -huh. It was amazing, <laughs> the transformation of Joshua Eaton uh, into a haunted house, um, which wasn't very haunted, it was very child friendly. Um, but our PTO, I would say, is second to none. They are incredible, they support us. It seems like daily with everything that they do for the students of Joshua Eaton. Um, and I'm proud to partner with them. And of course, our school advisory council, um, which I introduced two of the members, and also we have another parent member, Julie Ross. Uh, we actually had a meeting before this meeting, so got me warmed up. And then we also have teacher representatives, Jamie Quinn and Sandy Emery and um, Susie Libby, Susie Libby. No, sorry, <laughs> and Susie Libby, and with community member uh, Laura O'Neill, who owns um, Salon Laura Michael, and has been a uh, Reading resident all her life. So it's been exciting. Uh, we have our WASH uh, Council, Wellness, Allergy, Safety, and Health. And so what I love, too, is the collaboration between our WASH committee and our school council and the PTO. So the idea of everybody working together to support each other, I think, is a good role model for all students to see too. Um, and just another community, I mean this list could go on and on and on, I was trying to just like pick a variety of items, but we have our Veterans Day Assembly this, um, this Friday. So if you're able to join us, we welcome you to join us. This will be the 19th annual, and the last one for Jill Mayberry as she's retiring at the end of this year. So it's a very special event and I'm happy to be part of it. So um, something else is our intervention blocks and data study. Um, I'm not going to read all this to you, but basically up there I define the differences between corrective action, which is when we're in the classroom and we're just making adjustments as we're teaching, and then true intervention is when we use data and we say, what is this data actually showing us? It's showing us that these particular students are struggling, yes, but what specifically are they struggling on? So for example, maybe at the kindergarten level it's beginning sounds of S and V and T. So then what interventions are we putting in place for S and T and V? And then how are we knowing that we are successful and that students are learning? Well, that's part of the whole data cycle. We have to do formative assessment and really look at students and um, are they growing or are they not? And what do we need to adjust um, to, to make them successful? And so um, we have like what I'd call a bigger data cycle every six weeks. But then on a weekly basis, I'm meeting with most grade levels to review and answer questions and support um, and get feedback from the staff. Um, so, and most of our classroom teachers have, intervent have an intervention block every day. Um, but year after year, we're going to be um, making that more and more um, front and center of our schedules to support kids individually and what they specifically need. So why don't we stop and ask some sure. questions before you go into this and I'll sure. this. On the uh, slide that had the student attendance. Yes. Uh, so I noticed that's, from, that's last year's data. It is last year's data. So has in, have we been keeping track of this year and how that compares and mm -hmm. have you also, I mean it's not a not on here probably for the confidentiality, but are we figuring out where the yes. 
where it's coming from? Can you yes. So I kind of gave like a bird's eye view data for the last year. We are tracking the data. I have a special binder in the office where we're having the percentage, weekly percentage um, of attendance. And we, um, like I said, our goal is 98%. The only time so far this school year we've been at 98% or better was the very first week of school. We've been straddling between 97% and 97.9 every week thereafter. Um, and so this is kind of like um, beginning steps. We just approved our school improvement plan this afternoon and engaging in some more um, communication with families around attendance. Um, but we are tracking the data and I am making the phone calls and the letters are going home. Um, so we're kind of at the beginning But are you there. also looking at where, if there's any patterns within yes. the school? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at patterns in terms of the various subgroups um, to see if there are any trends. Um, specific family trends, we have found a couple of trends that way in terms of like a whole family unit and those are the students who are absent quite a bit and so what is behind that um, and then having like steps, action steps we want to take is like talking to the students to say oh you were out yesterday, where were you, what happened, you know and just could it be that some student might say I don't like coming to school but that's something that we need to talk about like why don't you like coming to school and creating action steps so that kids want to come in school and feel engaged and part of our community so yeah so along those lines, the um, I know we have resources within the schools, the school psychologists or counselors to talk to students, um, but I was really glad to hear you say that you're using the interface um, mm -hmm. service because I think that's such an incredible resource um, right. that really um, Erica McNamara and the coalitions, our coalition and other coalitions have really put together <coughs> to serve the communities. And I think it's, uh, I know it's also used quite broadly at the high school um, and what a good way to, you know, you, you may identify something, but it isn't your role to solve that right. problem for that family, mm -hmm. but this it allows a great connection and then allows us together to achieve the goal, goal of getting the student into school to learn. Right. So I'm, I'm just really pleased, and I know, um, so I, I had heard the high school utilizing it, and so this is the first time I've heard sort of the elementary uh, connection. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's really valuable. The um, you talked about on the slide with special education and you know looking at the different services and, and schedules and things. I thought Carolyn mentioned a tool that we have in the district that um, helps to do that so that it's not just all on paper. What, what was I thinking about? Um, a data tool. Not not for the schedule. No, you're talking about the IEPs on the the. Oh, What's it called? It's it's on eSped? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So eSped tracks, it's actually the housing mechanism for all the IEPs and 504s digitally. Um, so you are able to run reports, for example, like that's how we would know what are the annual review dates, what are the three-year three re-eval dates, like the ending dates. Okay. Um, and so, yes, we use, we use it in terms of that. Information. Okay, so that's being used, but your your data that you're keeping is very granular at mm -hmm. the school level. Very, very. Mm -hmm. Okay, student specific. Yes. Um, I had a question on oh, that. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Um, you mentioned that you might look into posting attendance on the tracks ultimately as sort of a community building. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any timeline for that? Um, we hope at our next school council meeting to talk about what exactly that will look like, whether it's just kind of like a sunshine in the corner of the tracks with a percentage and a little um, wording underneath. We're, we're still going to you know, be talking about that together to figure out what is the best procedure for that. I imagine you'd have to find a balance between celebrating good attendance in school mm -hmm. and not making any child who is sick or out for exactly. something legitimate. Exactly. Exactly. Can yes. I ask one more? Um, this actually, I think, is more a Dr. Doherty question, but it's related to the attendance data. Um, it looked to me like Killam might have some slightly elevated levels as well, so I'm just wondering if any of this work is happening. Same thing. They both mm -hmm. went to the same conference Again. together. <laughs> Great. Uh, been also, talking. also <laughs> the high school attended as well the same conference, so there are things going on at Killam as well. Awesome. Don't mean right. to steal the spotlight, but no. the question. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. No, thank you. Go ahead. 
just a quick um, thank you. You're talking about the analysis of the patterns of the attendance is really, um, I'm really appreciative of that because I think sometimes children fall under the radar when they're doing well, but they're not coming to school. So then they don't get noticed that they're not th this disjoint, this disconnect. And so having to do with the social emotional behavioral needs of kids, I think it's really important that you're noticing who's not there, regardless of their performance. Um, right. And I'll be interested to see some of the reasons. And I was one of the notes that I had written when reading through this was, um, is this Disney time? <laughs> right. Right. Like, right. are there patterns on times of year and relationship to long weekends, or are there right. other things going on? So I was um, very happy to see you're doing these in-depth in analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And it's interesting, too, because um, we've had a couple of examples already where um, several of the teachers have approached kids like, where were you yesterday? And I had the experience myself, too, and they were kind of like, oh, you know, just didn't come to school and like oh we missed you and just saying that to a student giving them that sense of belonging like their faces light up and um, not to get into too many specific details but a particular student who historically was having lots of attendance and tardy issues um, had that conversation and actually his attendance and his <laughs> uh, tardies are next to none at this point compared to the same time last year where um, I think he had um, close to 26 tardies. So baby steps, we're not, you know, um, sometimes everything, everything can seem very grand that we need to do, but sometimes it's just connection with people that um, support them and give them what they need to be successful. So thank you. So I wanted to change topics and talk about sure. reading. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned a couple times the Fontes and Pinnell mm -hmm. data. Um, when we heard our last update on Joshua Eaton's in the winter, I was Principal Sprung, and my recollection is that he had been doing some work to uh, on, on how that test and assessment, uh, an assessment of test rates that teachers worked on with students. Uh, and my recollection was that he had done some work with the team at Joshua Eaton to look at how that assessment was administered, and then had collected some data around kind of student grade level. And I'm wondering, you know, how you continued that work with your team, uh, how it's going. And just, you know, can you give us some uh, insight into how many kids are reading at grade level now in Joshua Eaton, where there's still work to be done, if, if, uh, if there are any particular areas? Okay, great. Uh, we've continued on with that work, and we actually started during our first staff meeting with uh, Stacy Kress, who's our um, uh, reading interventionist, and we did a, a little mini workshop on calibrating how Fontes and Pinnell is administered in every classroom and the scoring tool used and the MISQ analysis and really dug down deep just to reinforce because we had several new staff members and it was the start of the year and we wanted to make sure that our data was apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Um, so that's some of the work that we have done. We have already completed our first round of the Fontes and Pinnell for um, the fall season. And last week I met with grades K, one and two, and we actually looked at that data, excuse me, not K, K starts in December, but one and two, and we looked at that data and we um, looked at individual students in individual classrooms to say which students are reading on um, above and below grade level, and then dug a little bit deeper to say, okay, what are we specifically going to be working on for those students? So our next step is to actually talk about what do these text levels mean, because what is an A? What are the you know, t uh, text features for an A and a B and a C and a D? And um, what are those specific skills we're working on? So these are our next steps, not just to, because what I found too is when I had a parent conversation, my little parent coffee, it was understanding that when students are given a level, like, oh, you're a level D, that they're only reading level D books. And what that does is actually increases the gap for student achievement. Because really, students who are reading, um, according to Fonts Pinnell or D level, should actually be reading A, B, and C books to help develop their fluency, reading level D books for instructional, and actually reading E and F books to increase their vocabulary and critical thinking skills. Um, and so that was a great conversation I had with many families to kind of discuss, like, what do these levels actually mean and that we're not holding students back. 
Um, right this moment, I can't give you the exact percentages of on, above, and below, um, but we are doing that work at, at a very ground level, um, in an individual student level, at Joshua Eaton. Okay. Yeah, so if you, if there's any way that, you know, in terms of policy or in terms of resources, you can let us know what you know, Absolutely. But, I'd be happy um, to. You know, I'd, I'd be very interested in kind of future updates and understanding from this benchmark in, in the fall, how does that compare to where Principal Sprung left off? What are the, mm -hmm. what are the differences? Um, and I don't know if it's as simple as reading at grade level. To be clear, ABC is not like letter grades ABC. That no, it's not at This all. is a different yes. scaling tool yes. that's specific to the assessment that, mm -hmm. that's done by Ponce. No. But any kind of assessment there, I, I remember getting a number from Principal Sprung that, mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to misquote it, but a, a percentage number of students in, in that presentation. That, um, <coughs> and, and so what I'm interested in is if we look at as we go forward, the percent of students who are reading at grade level and whatever the appropriate assessment is, and, and mm -hmm. you're the, you know, have expertise in this, you can help us understand, but sure. whatever benchmark we're setting for ourselves and for our students, you know, are we targeting students that, maybe it's kids that have more absenteeism, maybe it's kids that, that are not mm -hmm. where the other kids are or exactly. where they could be. Um, what resources are we providing for those students in this intervention block or elsewhere? And then what kind of assessments are kids getting on their report cards? So, you know, if we have a situation where, I, and I'm making the number up, let's say 30% of kids aren't meeting some benchmark on a functional literacy, and it's totally a hypothetical number, you know, you, would, you wouldn't expect to see um, a disproportionate number of kids getting meeting the standard. Right. Right, so 60% mm -hmm. meets the standard, but only 30% are meeting a grade level or less. Mm -hmm. There should be some alignment between the assessment right. we're giving them and the, the assessment that these tools are providing the teachers. So, Whatever in our in our next assessment or a check in mm -hmm. with the school committee, any any kind of comparison of this is where we left off in sixteen seventeen. This is what the fall benchmark data told us in next assessment. This is where we've gone. This is what we need to do, right. and this is how when the grades come out with parents, this is how that compares. This is how many kids are meeting the standard, and this is how many kids are meeting, reading at grade level. So we don't have this. Either. They, they should be roughly proportional. Right. Right, and the other piece with that that um, I should have explained a little more clearly is like we have um, a master tracker um, spreadsheet. So on this master tracker is where we're collecting all the data that um, uh, for all the assessments that we've administered with students. And also um, there's a space where we check off which students are receiving which interventions, whether it be Title I or reading services. And so what that helped us do is when we did the filter on that data, we were able to see which students who were reading far below grade level were not receiving any services at all. And we also discovered several students who were receiving, for example, LLI and had made excellent gains, but because they received LLI, they continued to receive LLI. And so we had those important conversations, like these kids are ready to be more independent. And that our philosophy is not once you're in uh, reading services or Title I, you're there for the rest of your life. Our goal is to move children throughout the tiers to give them the support that they need for the skills in that moment of time. Um, and something else that we're looking at too around the actual levels is to say, what does this level actually mean? Is this their fluency level? Because you'll hear from a lot of teachers that they'll, they'll say, if I was basing this just on fluency, this child would just keep going and going and going and going. But when I look at their comprehension, that's what's holding them up. So the next question is, looking at that comprehension, is it text to self, is it text to the world, text to what? Like what level is holding them back? And that is our specific intervention. So we're trying to look beyond like individual letters and kind of say, all right, what do kids specifically need? And I appreciate that question for pushing me on that to give you that answer. Thank you. Oh, so on the um, intervention block, can you just clarify, um, is that a block that the, the teachers get to um, work on, you know, looking at the data and developing what the interventions are, or is that and, I, and where the students get the service, the intervention services in the classroom in some format or with a, a specialist if needed. Can you just clarify that? Sure, sure. So the intervention blocks, um, you could sort of think of it as flexible grouping as well. So the goal during that block is that the students who require the most need are getting the direct instruction. So if it, the intervention block is five days a week, those students would receive that intervention five days a week. And so you'd have your on-level students who receive it three days a week and your above-level students who maybe two days a week. But everyone's getting what they need. So those students who aren't meeting every day are also doing activities based on you know, the skills that they need to work on. When 
ever possible. Now the hard part for us this year, just to be transparent, is that the schedule was already created before I started. So it was really hard to kind of maneuver within a schedule that was already created. But I think we did a pretty good job. So ideally what we would like is our Title I and our reading staff and Mystic Valley readers to come in during the intervention block. So it's kind of like a more all hands on deck. And so different kids can get what they need at different times. Mm -hmm. um, and so during that intervention time, we're really looking at targeted skills for all students. Okay. Yeah. I have just one other question about the, um, I think last year was the part of the uh, update that we heard that Nick was referring to uh, about the um, literacy coach. So I'm just a little, we don't have, I'm, I'm wondering what services, um, when you talk about professional development and sort of the collaboration and the data meeting with great grade level teams, what resources, um, that maybe not your teachers, are you able to bring to that? Um, is it the same resources we had last year? I was having a little trouble remembering, and I don't know, maybe John has, a, has that info too. But. So the district has done, in my opinion, an outsider com coming in, an excellent job in providing um, um, uh, presenters from the Teachers College around Reader's Workshop and Writer's Workshop that m many of our staff members get to attend to um, hone in and you know, tighten their own practice. In terms of like the data meeting and the interventions, uh, there are a lot of recess resources. We obviously can always use more, but we're trying to look at what we have. So for example, we have this intervention book that, that ties directly into Reader's Workshop and Writer's Workshop and the skills we're looking for. That's just kind of like one example. And just digging deep to say, okay, how can we use those skills for interventions for our, our, our students? Um, and part of my background is curriculum data and assessment, so kind of bringing those tools um, to the table and then our staff is extremely resourceful as well so it's having that time to have that conversation that give and take and that collaboration that are supporting our students if I can just piggyback on that yeah. um, so I think I reported out to the committee we were not able to fill that position mm -hmm. um, with the candidate the qualified candidate that we felt would be a good a good match at this time so what we've done is we've taken the resources from that salary and we are applying it to bringing in, as, as Lisa Marie said, uh, consultants from Teachers College. And this, this is a this is a one year approach. This I would not recommend. This is a multi year approach. That we really should bring the literacy coach person, you know, hire a person back in, so that this person can work with teachers. But the model that we've been using this year, where we have, it's actually model lessons. I, I've uh, I know Craig has attended. I've attended. Um, and it's done by grade level where the teachers come in and they watch the consultant teach the model lesson and then they have a conversation afterwards um, and they come for multiple days and they're doing that several times during the year. Um, so they're actually teaching the lessons that we want our teachers to, uh, to use um, and the instructional strategies and how to use it. But long term, we, we need the coaching position back for next year. Okay, that's what I think I was recalling some of the conversations yeah. with that la the person who was here last year about you know being in the classroom and some mm -hmm. of the teachers that, that had experienced that. So um, so the model is different because we weren't able to get the person. But um, right, we lost the math coaching person last year. That position well, was cut in the budget. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, just um, a quick comment and a question, and this was something I shared with you in the staff meeting. A quick comment about the attendance data, because I, as a Josh Wheaton parent, was shocked by it, and I went into the state records, and I'm not saying this has to be a one-year blip for Josh Wheaton, but going back to 2009, Josh Wheaton was always below for one statistic, which was the um, rate of kids out 10 days and more. They were always below the district average. In fact, most years, they were the second best of all the elementary schools. And I can personally attest I had a child out three or four days straight last year with the flu. So I'm hoping we get our flu shots and this, <laughs> this goes away. And I just want to throw that in. But my question was for you, and I probably should have asked this earlier. So for kids who don't need intervention and say they're at, at or above grade level, what happens to them during intervention blocks? Mm -hmm. So they should receive enrichment um, activities to do, whether it's tied for example, poetry and nonfiction, science, STEM. Um, what have you, but every student should be getting what they need during that intervention block. So it's not, it's called intervention, 
um, but really it could be intervention slash enrichment. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I keep but different topics, special education. So I'm looking at your slide on special mm -hmm. education. So the last two weeks, probably where we had discussions that mm -hmm. um, were talking, focusing on the topic. And, and, um, so at a school like Joshua Eden, if we say it's 20%, I did a quick back of the envelope, roughly 70 to 80 IEPs. You know, if it's 19, 20%, I don't know if that's right. So it's, it's a fair number of different mm -hmm. um, students that have specific um, individual education plans. So the, um, some of those plans, I think, touch on the topics that, or, or require uh, expertise in the topics that you have in your special ed slides. Um, and there are you know, a number of emails and a number of you know, parents who came to speak in the last two weeks here raising some very serious concerns about their students or how students are, are being um, uh, educated in, in bridge program and other programs. I guess just anything you can say to speak to those parents and the concerns that they had from your position as being new and but being, I'm sure, very aware of the needs of not just um, the, the parents of the students. So there were a number of parents who spoke about students who have dyslexia. And I know you mentioned, mentioned the Wilson and Orton Gillingham certification, which I, I think are helpful for those that population. But not just the students in the bridge program, but all students on IEP. So what can you tell parents that are maybe concerned or have raised these issues or haven't <coughs> heard other parents raise them? So. So I, I think what I would basically say is that we, um, and it's hard because I don't want to sound like I'm saying anything negative about previous, you know, administration or things that have happened, but I also want to take a realistic approach to just me and Josh Wheaton right now and the staff now to say you know, we have a two-way um, communication and open-door policy to answer questions specifically that parents have. We try to start off on the right foot with that open house this summer, especially for the bridge students. Um, Parents, I can only speak to the parents currently in the program. You know, that they have been um, extremely happy, happy with the way things are going for their students. Uh, we're doing running records, we're, you know, not letting anything slip through the crack. And if we are, we want to know about it. Um, I know there was the issue, for example, about Lexia um, in one of the cases. And I just, I was sitting in the audience for all these meetings and I wanted to get up and say something and um, just provide some clarity. Right, and I think that would have been um, a conversation that could have been had to say, okay, what was the reason for the student not wanting to have Lexia? Well, Lexia, if you know the program, has a certain number of time frame for each student based on an assessment they take when they first start the program. And the program doesn't want you to do more, and it doesn't want you to do less. It wants you to do that certain allocated time. And I know <coughs> in the conversation that came out during the meetings here, it was about there was an outside tutor working um, with a student on, on Lexia, right? And so it wasn't about Lexia, the program. It was about a simple conversation that this tool is being used already uh, eloquently outside of the, the setting and that maybe a different tool could have could have been used. So it's, I think those clarity, I guess my point is that those points of clarity could have made a difference in the relationships um, potentially um, between the school and, and, and home. Um, I, not to get too personal, but I live this life. I have a son, I actually have two sons who have dyslexia. Um, both have a very rare form. Both boys present very, very differently. I have a son in an out of district placement, and at the time, it seems like it's a wonderful idea. I'll tell you, as he's a senior now, it's not a wonderful idea, because his peer group has diminished, and um, he has to travel far to go to school in the morning and to come home, right? And if I, I would have done anything in the world, to keep my boy where he should have been. So, I feel for them. I just wanted, you, you had said that that summer open house, which sounds like it was a great idea, again, for the current students and pa families of the bridge program, which is the um, language, part of the language learning. You said uh, pr maybe about 75% of the parents and attended and you surveyed them as a follow-up. Um, well, while they were there, we gave um, the students a little About Me page, and then while the students were doing that, the teachers and I, we actually met individually with every parent to say, <coughs> tell us your thoughts, what okay. are your concerns, what are your fears, what do we need to know? Tell us about your child. Mm -hmm. um, and then the parents also had a little survey form that they filled out with their hopes and dreams for their child, and things that we should know before the school year starts. Um, so that's kind of the approach that we took during that summer. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
one of the two. Okay. <laughs> been, up there, been up there a while. <laughs> okay. So I just want to start by saying this data is a week old, and I'm the type of person I like to dive deep into the data, and I just want to be honest that I have dived in, but not as deep as I would like to. Um, so I'll try to be um, as clear and succinct as possible. And I actually have more data in my hand than at what you're going to see on the screen, so I'll try to um, articulate that as well. So basically, um, looking at third grade from last year in ELA and math, these are the new bands um, for the MCAS 2.0. Um, and then what I decided to do was take the three categories that the state would look at in terms of accountability rating, even though there is not an accountability rating this year. But I thought those were three important points for us to discuss. So you can see for both ELA, ELA is this column here, and math is this column here. Going across for all students, our students were on the cusp of um, meeting expectations. And then students with disabilities um, were partially meeting expectations in ELA. And I highlighted it in kind of an orange that they are um, not meeting expectations in math in terms of the scaled score. And then also looking at our high needs group, which includes special education, economically disadvantaged, et cetera. Um, they were within um, the partially meeting expectations category. There isn't, uh, there isn't growth data for grade three um, because this is their first year of implementation of this assessment. Mm -hmm. So I thought we could look a little deeper at the data to kind of see where um, we are at in terms of the four categories. And so first over here we have all students and when looking at this um, data for, um, I'm sorry, let me just go into one more page. For um, all students, you can see that um, we were in between meeting expectations or partly meeting the expectations. When looking at students with disabilities, 100% of our students fell within the partially and not meeting the expectations. So when looking at that data and then comparing it to um, state and district data, um, in those same two categories for the district uh, was at 82% combined and then the state data was 86% combined. So um, none of that data is great at all. And particularly, um, we know that's where uh, we have some work cut up for us to look at. Um, advancing on now to math in grade three, um, looking at the data for all students, we um, kind of following the same trend as in ELA. So looking at students with disabilities, Again, 100% of our students fell, um, partially meeting expectations or, or the 73%, which is uh, not meeting the expectations. When looking at that data compared to the state, combined for the district is 65%, um, and then for the state it was 81%. So uh, again, another area of concern for us to figure out what is happening. Then looking at the fourth grade, um, and there is a growth percentage here, which I think is important for us to look at. For all students, again, we're on the cusp of meeting expectations, but an important thing to look at here is for our student growth. Our students made um, better than average growth. So our students um, demonstrated knowledge and learning. Um, the average growth for a student growth percentile is between 40 and 60. As you can see, we're at 62 for ELA and 65.5 for math. Um, then when you break it down by students with disabilities, uh, we were partially meeting expectations in ELA and again, not meeting expectations in math. And same with our high needs students, we fell um, in the partly meeting expectations range. When digging deeper into this data, um, and I'm just going to keep drawing our attention because we're, just to be honest, as we go through all the slides, and I'm sure you've seen this, students with disabilities is the area where we need to focus most of our attention um, in terms of, of um, working with our students. So students with disabilities, um, in terms of um, together combined, partially meeting and not meeting expectations was a 93%. When looking compared to the district was 
um, 81% and the state was 87%. For our high needs population, combined it was 88%, uh, the district was 76% and the state was 72% um, in those ranges. Who's in the category of students with disability versus the high needs, and do they overlap mm -hmm. at all? These they two do. Categories. So students with disabilities are, are those students who are on IEP strictly. Okay. And then high needs include students who are um, termed economically disadvantaged, special education. Um, English language learners. Thank you. So English it's a, a much bigger population. It's a bigger end yes. size. Well, there may be some students that are in all three categories in high right. needs. Right. So when so when looking at all students, all means all, so every yeah. single student in the grade, mm -hmm. and then this breaks it down by students who are on IEPs only, um, and then this group here is a combination of our uh, English language learners, students who are deemed economically disadvantaged, and our special needs population. And some kids, just to be clear, are special education, ELL learners, and economically disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. On the bar graphs, do we know or do we have data elsewhere that tells us for the all students, how many students are you only in the all students and not in the other two? Yes. So back in my office, because I came in on the weekend, this is after this PowerPoint was created, I actually have exactly who are the students who are the 5%, the 51%, the 36%, and the 8%. And then the mm -hmm. same thing for each category. So it's because that's where I want us to kind of direct our attention as we work together as a staff to kind of glean what, what do these numbers actually mean. So that's the tricky thing here is the, the total base for each of these graphs is different. Mm -hmm. So you're not really looking, so you have what, 80, 388 students total mm -hmm. broken down by grades, you know, you're like 40 to 80 kids, right? Right. Maybe 20% of those fall into one of these two graphs on the right, maybe, I'm guessing, I mean, mm -hmm. there's 60, exactly. I think we're around 20, 18, 19% mm -hmm. um, IEPs for the, or special needs for the district, but Overall, I don't know how Eaton is specifically. So that the, the thing that would be really interesting to me in targeting is how many students are, there's two pieces, right? How do we meet the needs of the kids in the right two? Mm -hmm. And then second, are there any kids who aren't in those two graphs on the all students? And if they're not in the green bar or the blue bar, mm -hmm. they're in mm -hmm. the not meeting that 36% or the 8%, what's going on? Right, exactly. Do they need to be in one of these other populations exactly. are they getting what they need do they get the right intervention are they absent all the time I and mean, what's going mm -hmm. on right exactly right. And, that's the work and, and, they keep and, do. and this test was administered in the fall of 16. this was no the spring spring of 17. spring, spring of 17. Spring of so 17. march april of um, last yes, school march, year eight, march much in may mm -hmm. so now april. we're first learning who yeah. those students were to be able to optimize our delivery right. of service. Okay. And the other difficult piece with this is that because this is MCAS 2.0, it cannot be compared to the right. legacy test, right? right? So it's kind of like we're starting from scratch, yep. and this is the baseline, yeah. and the state themselves have come out and said, okay, this is baseline data. Don't be alarmed when you see all these numbers in partially meeting expectations and not meeting expectations, because the rigor of this test, rigor not meaning hard, but rigor meaning um, high order thinking and critical thinking, is very, very different than the legacy test. And you saw similar results to these um, way back when, when we started the legacy MCAS test, the first, I think it was two years of implementation. These are what the numbers looked like then as well. Just to give them some time to adjust instruction and to really dive in and say, what do these numbers actually mean? So can I just, yeah. um, so I think, I, I don't know how you put that information on every slide, but I almost feel like, you know, there's got to be like this slide taken, um, a screenshot of it and put someplace is real people don't know what that data is because you don't know what, what test was it really it is MCAS 2.0 what are the what what is the frame that you should have in your mind when you look at this data and so I just think we have to be you know as careful as possible and you know maybe the if this is data that is going to go out to the your local your school community you know the, the front page probably has all that on there but the front page gets separated. Somebody screenshots that and zoom off. It goes with 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 uh, without the context, right. and that concerns me because what I hear you talking about um, with your staff here is the incredible dive and dissection and 
-hmm. And but you have everything you have said has focused on the students. I, I dive into data all the time at work, but we're building ion implanters. We are not building people. Mm -hmm. And I am just so I'm so impressed with what what you're saying. <coughs> you get none of that from looking at the slide. Right. And right. That's it is the, mm -hmm. So uh, and I don't know. It's kind of very surface right. data. Really, I don't know what the balance is here, but right. I appreciate the next time more detail. <laughs> Sorry, um, you just mentioned the student growth potential. Mm -hmm. Next slide before growth with respect to what? If this so, is the first time the test has been mm -hmm. offered, so the only thing that can carry through is the school, school uh, the student growth percentile. That is something, and so basically. How they figure that out is they look at all of the students and they say, where was their learning capability before compared to peers of the same, you know, grade, for example, and how did people grow over time in the year of taking this test? And so basically they're saying that of their peer group that took the same exact test that started at the same exact point, our students showed above average growth. And so the reason why students with special needs, I'm sorry to describe this before, and high needs do not have a growth percentile is because the population is less than 20. I think it was 14 students. Mm -hmm. The state is calling it a transitional uh, student growth percentile. Mm -hmm. so, the, can I just? I was just going to add, we talked about that a little bit when we transitioned to park, that the state would make the point that this, the SGP, the student growth percentile, was always based on a different test in the past. Mm -hmm. But as Lisa said, you know, they're looking at the cohort of kids mm -hmm. who scored similarly on whatever that previous test was. Right. And then how did that similar cohort now perform? On this other test. Right. right. Exactly. So that's really encouraging. That's good. And we need to keep that up. Yes. And we will. <laughs> and we will. Um, so this is basically, you, see, you saw the data. I can just kind of go through here and then get to, hey, what are we working on? How's that? Um, so obviously we're going to be examining students with disabilities and high needs subgroups in more depth and really looking at um, going deeper, the depth, not the breadth of um, what our students are learning. We're going to, going to continue to support writing the various uh, text types and purposes because while the math data was, um, you know, showed um, some discrepancies when digging a little bit deep, not very deep, into the data. A lot of it was around problem solving. So about, is it about reading the problems? Is it about writing uh, the essays to solve the problems? And so those are some of the things that we're tying into our literacy goal for our school improvement plan as well. Because um, we feel strongly that you have to have strong literacy to have strong anything else. Um, provide more consistent math instruction, K to five, so that's the staff and I are working on together. Uh, continue to narrow the proficiency gap in math um, and uh, support parents and what does that look like. Uh, collaboration between general education staff and special education staff. Focus on targeted interventions in ELA and math. And how are we going to do that? This incredible staff is how we're going to do that. These are some of the hardest working people I've encountered in my 25 year career. Um, and people always say, like, what's the problem? What's the problem? It's not this staff, I'll tell you right now, because I have, um, you know, asked for a lot and uh, they have uh, come to call and uh, are very involved and very invested um, in the student achievement of all students at Joshua Eaton. Um, so we're going to continue to look at those achievement gaps and um, develop stronger intervention skills um, to support our students. Thank you. That was excellent. Oh, thank you. Really good job. Lots of lots of information. Um, the one the one thing that I thought of as you were going through the areas to work on would also be to include identifying students who are in the all students bucket but don't show up on the radar for these other intervention, higher intervention groups and what's going on there. So I mean, just back of the envelope, if you have 60 kids in the fourth grade according to these enrollment numbers, 40% of those are below, that's 24 kids. Mm -hmm. So of that 24, how many don't show up? I don't know the end values for the other two, but you know, if it's 12 or so, then that leaves about 10 or 12 kids that 
what's going on. So it's not a huge number per grade, but it may be a really huge return on, you know, helping kids with maybe what what is causing it. I don't know. You know is it? There's an excellent report in Edwin Analytics that actually tells you those numbers and who are the students who are on the cusp, and it actually will list for you those students, and then from there you can take that into a data analysis to see where, mm -hmm. where specifically, what domains, for example, were they struggling with, mm -hmm. um, and so that's some of the work too, is looking at, for example, like math, right? And so sometimes you say, oh, this child scored poorly in math, but then when you really look at it, you say, actually, their measurement and data and their geometry is spot on. They're really, really good. It's their number sense that needs work. And again, okay. that ties into that intervention piece and what specifically in number sense do they need work with? And just digging deeper and deeper and deeper to find those answers to make those changes for kids. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can, can, we're talking about problem solving and we're talking about a standardized test. And you brought in all the different um, skills that are needed in order to perform on these tests. So it's not just the reading of the problem, it's the processing, it's the delivery of the answer. And at any of those points, it could be an issue with any of those points and not the understanding and not um, whether or not they could do the problem or answer the problem. And the other thing that I wonder about is um, how can students, um, when those tests are being scored, can you dig, dig deep enough to see if the answer that was given by a student is actually, could actually make sense outside of the expectations of the test? So if a student is thinking about a problem and problem solving and they come up with an alternative solution to what was expected, can you see that? It depends. Was I clear it my depends question? on the type of question. Like the the open response questions where they're writing, um, as far as I know, we couldn't in the past. We can't see their answers, but there um, there is some work that you can do on individual questions, and so it's an item analysis by question. And if you glean that, let's say 50% of the students got picked the wrong, same wrong answer, mm -hmm. we, then we do what's called. Um, uh, um, misconception analysis, why? Why do we think, is it vocabulary? Is it the actual work around the problem? Is it the concept? Is it the application? Is it procedural skill? Like all of those things. What is the conceptual knowledge they needed to have about that skill prior to? How are we teaching that in prior grades? I mean, you just keep going on and on and on. Just, just kind of figure that out. Um, and I, I just would add to that, maybe they've just found another way to think about the problem. Oh, that too. I that too. Yeah, but they do have rubrics, so um, they do post um, um, the word escaped me. Oh. Exemplars, there it is. <laughs> Exemplars, so for example, if it's on a rating scale of from four to zero, obviously zeros, they haven't written anything at all, but they'll say, well, this is a four, this is a three, this is a two, this is a one. So then we need to do work to look at that, like why, why are they assessing this as a four, a three, a two, and a one, to help our students who might answer. We never want to say that, that there's only one way to have a correct answer, but we want to guide them in the most effective answer. Mm -hmm. So you can see right down, sorry. You can see right down to the answer that the student has given. Not on like an open response, but the state gives oh, us yeah. exemplars of Those. a model to say, this is what we expect from a fourth grader to write. This is, we have four. This is exceeding the standard. And then they'll say, well, this is an example of a three for students who are meeting the example. And they'll give like criteria typically um, as part of a rubric. And then this is a two and then this is a one. So as teachers, that helps us to kind of look and say, okay, are we asking our students to, I'm just making it up, use voice, more voice and dialogue in uh, their writing because that would be the expectation for a third grader to have exceeding the standard or meeting the standard or what have you. So that's kind of how we would use those tools. Yes. Thanks. Thank you for the presentation. Um, very welcome. I appreciated your candor in a couple of moments. That's very helpful. So I think it's powerful when you look at you're very transparent and say this this result isn't good enough and right. we're eager to fix it. So I appreciated that very, very much. And I think the community does too. Um, I think this is sort of only, uh, Mrs. Webb was kind of getting to this. 
I think where you provided context, it was very helpful. So when you said 100% of our students scored here, the district was here, the state was here. So I would encourage you as you move forward with these kind of presentations to do that. And I, my question is around that. Early on, in actually grade three, four, and five, um, it looks like the kids are right on that cusp mm -hmm. of meeting expectations. Do you have the data of how that compares to state uh, or um, the district? And I can look it up if you don't. I don't want to put We're going to get the rest of Next week, you're going to yeah. get a okay. full MCAS yeah. presentation. All right, so we'll get that. I was trying to tell this is going to kind of be an overview yeah, this because we're been. doing yeah. it. And then the elementary principals are all presenting um, later in the month as I well. Great. Great. Well, thank you for that. And actually, then I'll. Uh, I'll address this to Mr. Martin, um, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that context for all of the results, whether it's state average, peer communities, or um, across the district. So that's helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Is there a curriculum component here at all? So is this new test testing a curriculum that's new to our teachers at this level for either ELA or math? It really should be about the standards and how well are we teaching the standards and giving ourselves the opportunity when looking at the standards to let go of things that maybe in the past we were teaching that are negotiable now, that aren't priority to the grade level. So that's some of the work that we're doing either through our PLCs or within Joshua Eaton um, ourselves. Um, but it is gonna, just going to be honest. It's going to take some time. Um, and our starting point is the great work that has already been done um, in the district and just kind of pulling it back out um, as they did adjust the standards in the spring of 2017. They tweaked them just a little bit. Um, to make sure that what we're teaching is accurate to the standards of the grade level. Okay, so there is a component of developing and training teachers here that could be reflected in how students are answering questions. Okay. So we'll take it to his question. <laughs> Very quick. <laughs> and it might not need to be answered now. But one of the things that keeps, I hear, I hear what you're saying about the exemplars and the, the question that's going through my mind is, do the teachers agree with the exemplars? Do they agree with what's being required of our students at different grades? Um, we know that the scoring's lower. We were told to expect that. And so I, I don't expect an answer now, but that's something that I'd really like to understand too because just because we're told these are what the frameworks are and these are what we're striving for. I'd also like to know, because I really have great respect for our teachers and what they sense our kids should know when. Um, and we have very anxious kids. So I'm really concerned about that and wondering and worried about, where, anxious, about where that's coming from. And so I'd really love the perspective of our teachers. I know they have to strive towards improved scores but I want to make sure that it's not at the cost of our students and that the, the goal, the exemplars, are the appropriate ones mm -hmm. at the appropriate mm -hmm. grades. Mm -hmm. And we're fortunate enough that we're able to do that work through our Writers Workshop Professional Development and the work that we're doing, right? So it's helping us to calibrate what does that look like for us. So I think it's work to be done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you separately. very much. Just take a two minute recess. Great job. Thank you. Call the meeting back to order, and now we were going to go into the uh, superintendent's goals presentation. So this evening, the district improvement. Um, we uh, this is the time of year that normally, and actually this is the time of year we're having these conversations with all of our um, teachers and administrators when we're discussing the goals uh, at the school committee level. Uh, we're having two discussions tonight. One is the district improvement plan goals and separately but connected is the superintendent's goals. Um, before I get into the actual details of the, the plan, and I'm not gonna go line item by line item on the action plan. Um, I'm hoping that you had the opportunity to read those. But before we go into that piece of the discussion, I do want to provide some comments and context um, to where I think we are. Uh, and I am going to be reading some notes that I've, that I've put together because I didn't want to miss any of the details that I wanted to make sure that both the committee and the community um, have. So first of all, um, what I've learned over the years as a superintendent in 
I mean, now in my ninth year, is that one of the most important skills that I can have as a superintendent is to listen, but not just listen, but listen to different perspectives of staff, of families, and the community to see if we can use that feedback to improve what we do. And as the leader of this district, I have also learned that what I do, what I say, and what I model can have a tremendous impact on the effectiveness of what we are doing and the impact that it can have on the team. And when I mean team, I mean both the central office team and our administrative team. And that has become more and more clear to me, especially in the last couple of years. So before I engage in the conversation about the district improvement plan and the goals, I want to reintroduce you to the team. Uh, Carolyn, unfortunately, could not be here tonight, but um, I want to introduce all three members of the team that are here every Monday that we meet or every other day that we meet as a, as a group. Um, and this team is well qualified in their fields with a combination of skill and experience to help our school district ascend to the next level and help carry out the district improvement plan that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I am proud that I have hired each member of this team and I am honored and excited to work with them. They are the right people for the challenges that we are facing now and that we will be facing in the next several months. The first member of the team that I want to introduce to you or reintroduce to you is Gail Dowd, our Director of Finance, who was the newest member, hired just 14 short months ago. You may remember that Gail is a certified public accountant, a rarity in the education world, but a tremendous asset in this era of fiscal accountability and stability. She has a master's in business administration. In the business sector, Gail was a vice president of Eaton Vance Management in Boston, a leading global asset manager. Gail changed careers and came to Reading because she wanted to make a difference. In her 14 months, she has done just that as she has accelerated her learning curve and has tackled many challenges head on during this difficult fiscal time. She has built strong relationships with staff, town officials, and the community and is very well respected among her peers. Gail provides support and guidance on financial issues to building principals, central office administrators, the facilities department, and athletics. She oversees the food service department and works very closely with our human resource administrator. She understands and applies strategic planning and analysis on a daily basis. Recently, she completed the first leg of the Massachusetts Certified Public Purchasing Official Program or MCPPO. You heard a little bit about this evening about going out to bid for different things. So this is, this is one of those uh, skill sets. This will improve our capacity as a school district to operate effectively in public procurement of goods and services. Next, I'm going to talk about Carolyn Wilson, our Director of Student Services. Carolyn has been our director for over three, a little over three years. She is a Juris Doctor, has a Master of Science in Special Education. She has also worked in the State House and the United States Department Office of Civil Rights, the same group of the OCR complaint. In previous districts, she has been a team chair and an out-of-district coordinator. In her first year as Director of Student Services, Carolyn initiated the Walker Report Review of our special education programs and services, and with limited resources, she has been making the changes the report is recommending. The changes that have not been made require additional resources which we do not have at this time. Carolyn also serves on the board of the Northeast Chapter of the International Dyslexia Society. In addition, last week, Carolyn was chosen to be a member of the Boston Children's Hospital Learning Disabilities Advisory Council. Only eight special education directors in the entire state were chosen for this council. Finally, we have Craig Martin, our Assistant Superintendent for Learning and Teaching. Craig has been in the Reading Public Schools for over 20 years. And prior to that was an educator in the Los Angeles public school system. He is a nationally recognized educator receiving the National Middle School Association Educator of the Year Award and has presented at several state and national conferences as well as worked with schools all over this country. When he was principal at Coolidge, the school was one of the few schools in the state that reached adequate yearly progress every year under the old No Child Left Behind Federal Accountability Guidelines. 
Currently, Craig is serving as a mentor for a new assistant superintendent in a central Massachusetts school district and was specifically chosen because of his skill and expertise as an educational leader who is well respected among his peers across the state. He too has done more with less as he's been developing structures that help develop teacher leaders to support the work that we have been doing. Our progress in teaching and learning has been slow because we do not have the instructional supports that most school districts enjoy. If you think about it, Craig oversees each curriculum area, the K-12 alignment of those areas, the professional development planning for all those areas, and the communication for long-range planning for those areas. In addition to these roles, he is also the assistant superintendent and is brought in to assist with bullying and harassment investigations, works collaboratively with the RTA, and participates in contract negotiations, oversees teacher induction, our adult and community education program, the extended day program, and the MECO program. He works very closely with Carolyn and Gail on a variety of issues, including professional development, grants, and purchasing materials. I want to reemphasize that each of these three central office administrators have no additional support to help accomplish the tasks that I just described. But somehow their commitment to their work never seems to waver. They are student-centered and dedicated to ensuring our district is supportive of all students. In addition to a strong central office team, I am proud to say we have a very strong group of dedicated principals. You heard one of them this evening. Collectively, I believe this is now one of the strongest groups of instructional leaders in the state. I don't say that lightly. Over the last few years, when we have had a principal vacancy, we have strategically been hiring candidates who have strong instructional background and served in a former role as an instructional coach. Lisa Marie, who you heard tonight, has been a coach both at the building level and at a district level in another school district. This is absolutely critical as we continue to shift our instructional practices in our classrooms. I am proud to say that four of our eight building principals were an instructional coach in their former school district. To use a football analogy, over the last several years, the goalposts have been moved several times, and the game of education has changed. In the past five years, there have been three new sets of straight state frameworks in science, mathematics, and literacy. And we've had three different state assessments, the legacy MCAS, the park, and now the next generation MCAS, with the assessment moving from paper to online. Our high school has also seen changes in the SAT and the AP exams. And the legacy MCAS at the high school level will be replaced by the next generation MCAS in 2019. And that is also scheduled to go online. While all these changes are definitely in the best interest of students in Massachusetts, there is no question that it puts stress and strain our administrative team and on our staff. At a, as a district that is comparatively very lean in administrative leadership, and without curriculum directors, major changes are more challenging to navigate than for many other districts. In addition, of course, all of this is happening in Reading during a time of tighter and tighter budgets, where each year the level service budget is being reduced from the previous year. I say this only because I think it's important to recognize the challenges of our staff that they have been collectively facing and to express extreme gratitude for their ongoing efforts. As I introduce the district improvement plan and the superintendent's goals to you this evening, I want to remind the committee of the presentation you heard a few weeks ago from Craig and Courtney Fogarty, our data coach. Over the last two years, we have been using our data much differently than we ever have before to help us inform our practices in the classroom, how we differentiate our support <coughs> for students, and how we use our shrinking resources more equitably. It is very important that this shift occurs so that we can build the capacity of each teacher and administrator in this district to use the data as strategically as possible to best support students. I think you heard some of that this evening in the Josh Eaton presentation. Five years ago, we were not using data as effectively in our schools and in our district, and this led to some of the concerns that we are facing today, with some areas in our MCAS scores that are not strong, particularly in certain grades, at certain schools, and math and literacy at the elementary level. We did not have structures in place that allowed for discussion to occur among teachers and administrators and what areas needed to be addressed. Those structures do exist today with our professional learning communities, our grade levels, our team and departments, 
and our building leadership teams. And because of the limited resources we have in the district, we are strategically focusing our training and materials purchasing in a few key areas, and I've outlined those in the district improvement plan. One area is writing at the elementary level. Another area is science curriculum implementation. Another area is implementing advisory at the middle school level. The, uh, another level area is level consolidation in middle school math and at the high school. And these are outlined in your district improvement plan. And then the last group uh, is the review of the special education language-based programs and the specialized reading services. These are the five areas that we are committing our resources, our time, and our energy to this year because we cannot do it all. We have a lot of areas that we need to work on and we acknowledge that, but if we keep focusing on many, many things, none of them are gonna get done. So that is what this district improvement plan is, is taking a look at. So I wanna direct the committee to the district improvement plan piece and if you start on page five, the four areas that we are looking at primarily are closing the achievement gap, literacy, mathematics practices, social emotional learning, and communication. Those are the focus areas. Mm -hmm. The activities I just mentioned are the areas that we are working on specific to the focus areas. The measures of progress that we're using are listed here under each of the four areas that you see. So for example, under closing the achievement gap, the measure of progress includes a decrease in the achievement gap on state and local assessments, um, an increase in students having equitable access to higher level classes, and an increase in students having grading opportunity to access high quality tier one instruction. You can see the same for literacy, for mathematics, for social emotional learning, some of the areas that we're looking at is a decrease in discipline referrals, including suspensions, a decrease in student anxiety, a decrease in substance abuse, as, and the YRBS plays a key role in that data collection, um, a decrease in the number of students who have 10 or more absences, as you heard tonight. That's one of the key data points. For schools that do not have these gaps, they're not focusing on these areas. They're focusing on the areas that the, the gaps do occur for their school. So not every school is focusing on all these areas. It really depends on uh, where the gaps are for their school. So something that Joshua Eaton may be working on, would then may not be working on, and vice versa. So if you move to page six, and it continues on for several pages, you can see that we have specific action plans um, with process benchmarks. The person that is directly responsible, but that doesn't mean that's the only person doing the work. It means this is the person overseeing it. The date and the status. Um, the categories that we've used this year are slightly different, just so that you know. When you see the word complete, which if it was in color, you would see green. Um, it is either completed or it's ongoing, which means it's done, but we're, gonna we have to, we're continuing to do it. If you see in process, it means that we've begun this work, but the steps are not all complete. And if it's planned, it means that we've not started it yet. And some we have consciously not started this year because we're only focusing on a few activities and the resources that I mentioned earlier. How do you know if it's complete and ongoing at this? The complete means no, either I, it's done or we're we're continuing. So so you've done, but you're gonna, but it's a, but it's a. It's one of those things you have to continue doing. So how do we know which ones are things? Are they all that? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, some some are a one-time oh, activity. So how do we know which one of these are one-time versus one right. time and ongoing? You know what I'm asking? So like the first one is, the first one, this administrative council. That would be a one, one and done. That's a one and done, yeah. right. But then the th using the early warning indicators. That's an ongoing. ongoing. Right. All right. 
you can kind of figure it out by reading. I think by, yeah, by looking at it, yeah. Last year we got feedback that it was too confusing having four categories. So that's why we narrowed it down to three because if it is ongoing, it's already completed. Mm -hmm. We just continue to do it. So you see we have action plans for all of the areas. Um, action plan A and B are the, the areas, are primarily the areas that we're focusing on at the elementary level. Um, at the high school and middle school level, it's, it's action plan A and D, the social emotional piece. Some of the things that I mentioned in the, the you know the, the activities that we're focusing on this year, um, could, for example, at the elementary level, we are focused on the implementation of writers' workshop, mm -hmm. and so that would fall under both A and B because it's literacy and closing the achievement gap. Um, the The science curriculum piece is focused on action plan A, closing the achievement gap. And as you, as you know, we are currently in year two of that, that focus. Um, so this year, we are piloting some lessons in K-2, to um, continuing implementation in grades three through eight, and beginning implementation in nine through 12. If funding is available for year three, uh, the focus will then shift to K-2 to and the high school with the continued implementation in grades three through eight. So can I just ask, if, do you mind if I ask or do you Sure, yeah, you can ask. So know. you just made it, if funding is available. In for um, year three. So when I went into this, when I signed up for that, it was for three years. So funding, is, as far as I'm concerned, is going to be available. I'll just put that Okay. There. Right? I, mean, I, I would agree with that, and it was certainly when we presented to FinCom, right. it was presented as we will need a commitment for one-time funds or for over three years. Of course, a lot's changed, and it's a conversation that has to happen, but I agree with you. The community expects a three-year implementation. Yeah. Implement the advisory at the middle school. Um, this is being funded primarily out of the uh, school transformation grant, but is uh, it's restructuring our advisory at the middle school level, and. They're implementing the Facing History in Ourselves program, which is timely given um, some of the issues that we've been facing in, uh, in the schools um, around the graffiti. Uh, but this, this is an outstanding program. Um, I got a chance to observe uh, a lesson in, during one of the advisory periods at Parker. Um, and this program really is going to um, help students understand empathy, reflection, improve, and actually it does uh, improve research shows it improves their academic performance and it builds safe and supportive, safe and inclusive schools. Um, in terms of the level consolidation, this is a phase in approach over the next few years. Um, at the middle school, the math levels this year in grade seven were reduced from three to two. And next year they will be reduced from three to two at, in eighth grade. At the high school, uh, depending on the department is how the phase-in is going to be occurring. So science is consolidating to two levels this year um, from three, um, and then they will start phasing in in 10th grade, then 11th grade. Um, social studies is consolidating in two levels to grade, in grade 9 and 10. English is already consol is consolidating grades 9 through 12 this year. And so training is underway. Um, and intervention blocks are being scheduled to support students um, as this is being implemented. And then finally, the last piece is the review of the special education language-based program, which Carolyn and Craig are working closely uh, with the CPAC, and that's for the, the bridge program and the specialized reading services. So those are the five areas that we're working on that are aligned to the goals in the district improvement plan, and those are reflected in the action steps. So I don't know if there was any questions for us in the district improvement plan before I went to the goals. Uh, uh, thanks. So Dr. Zardi, I just, um, your, what you outlined is 
great, and I want to make sure that um, I can sort of identify each of those things specifically to the items in the plan. And so um, I, I don't know whether um, you can sort of help us target those specific items, or if we have your notes, we can look through that. But I just want to make sure that I when, I, when I look at the document and I'm just sort of leafing through it, that I know where I'm, you know, I'm connecting the dots. So that if I look at, um, uh, like, increase the level of consistency of class classrooms as seen on common assessments, um, I don't know if that's one of the ones that connects to um, these major areas that you identified. But I just want to make sure that I can do that. So maybe if we have your notes, I would be able to do that, unless I'm missing something about how to use the tool. So there are different specific steps. Right. What I mentioned, oh, so I, let, let, let's work backwards. Maybe okay. that's probably better. So right, um, the science curriculum implementation, if you notice on page 7, it's the last three action steps. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the level consolidation uh, is the fifth to the last step. Oh, on that same page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The writing at the elementary level is in the focus area B, action plan B. Um, so that's page nine, and there are several steps listed that refer to professional development, um, in-class coaching, yeah. lab classrooms, that's all the writing piece. Okay. Um, implementing advisory at the middle school level is the uh, action plan D. I know it's in here somewhere. Uh, it's actually the last. No. Yep. It's up top on page 15. Oh, okay. thank you. The middle school. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> and the review of special education programs, I believe, is in action plan A. The last step. But you heard some other things tonight that yeah. we are also, so the intervention blocks that Joshua Eaton is using, are, these are in all the schools, mm -hmm. that's an action step. Um, professional development in, diff in different trainings are action steps. So there, there's small action steps and there's larger action steps, I guess mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. Right. So can I just ask, is this when this district improvement plan and these details, are these the details that you use to manage as you go throughout the year like this yes. um, chart? So yes. you, you use this, this as a document to manage with your staff? Yes. And okay. when I do my mid-cycle review mm -hmm. to the committee, you will see an updated like you have in previous years. Right. Updated status. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, okay. So for those of us who are joining the process at this point for the first time, like myself and anyone else that's looking at this, it's a very complex document we have, and to be clear, it, it, it governs three years of activity, right? So 16 to 19 overall. And that's this is the second year of the second plan. Second of a three-year process. Correct. And so you have a series of just kind of walking through the documents. We have kind of the high-level overview on page one, right? Um, one question on that, I just have questions on pages, and I'll just go in order. Um, on page one, you have four focus areas, and those we see again later, right? Closing the achievement gap, et cetera. What I notice in areas two and three, literacy, literacy and maths, is, is that there's this pacing chart, which is the only specific thing mentioned in this group of goals. Do we have that yet, or when are we going to see it? I'll, I'll actually have Craig answer that piece. Um, so the ELA for grades K through 5 are available on our website. Okay. And they're there. We have math for the same grades. They've been shared with the teachers. 
we're making some final revisions or some proofreading things to get those on the website as well. Um, six through eight in both of those areas, we also have drafts, and so those should be going up pretty soon. So those are the two areas that we are focusing on first. How many pacing charts should there be when this is done? Well, essentially, we should have curriculum documents for every grade level of every content area. So 12 so times at least two, yeah. right? So 24 minimum if you count literacy as one and math as one, right? 12 times two. Um, yeah, if you're talking Not about just those two content areas. Yeah, so yeah. at least 24 yeah. pacing charts by the end of next year, and you've talked to us about so two or three. Right. So that's a lot of work to do next year on pacing charts. It is. And, it, well, and I don't know. I think for the ELA and math, we're well on our way. Okay. Um, and then as we're going to be making the adjustment to the new science standards, mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I think of all of the content areas and without directors and people who do this work, no, it, it's a much slower process. Okay. It doesn't yeah. sound like it's a three-year. It sounds like it's beyond the th three years. I mean, if... Um, so it, I, again, it depends how many there are. Well, I just want to be clear on what the goal is, right? So is, is the goal, it just says, and a pacing chart. Everything else on here is more abstract. But that's very concrete on page one, right? You say you're going to have a literacy pacing chart, you're going to have a math pacing chart, and you say there's one for each grade that, in my mind, is 24 charts by the end of next year if this is a, a plan that ends in 2019. And... Every one of those work streams should be represented in this list of hundreds of different benchmarks that we see starting on page six. Is that accurate? Or do we need to revise the goals? I think, I think for the two content areas that are part of our goals, literacy and mathematics, mm -hmm. I think that may be doable, um, especially through K through eight. I think high school, I think, um, well, we might have outlines of it to have full curriculum documents. I don't know yet at this point. Okay. Um, so in, in fairness to the superintendent, right, we've had budget cuts and staffing reductions since these were drafted, right? We've, we've talked previously as a committee mm -hmm. about how the committee set a set of three-year goals. Circumstances have changed somewhat in that the level service budget was rising at over 4.5%, and that led to some cuts in staff and resources. That's all factual history here. So we had a discussion that I remember after the last budget uh, about how we would need to revisit the goals and make sure they're aligned to available resources. So the pacing charts may be something I'd be interested in where those revisions may occur in the pacing charts are just kind of one example of that. Um, so I'd be interested from the superintendent in learning in, f in future uh, meetings as agendas permit how we're going to focus, and we heard five areas here, but these are five areas of focus you've given us. What's dropping off the goals? What are we not doing? Is it the 22 other pacing charts? Is it something else that we're not doing? Not, you don't have to answer now, but I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in learning how we have to adjust our expectations to make sure we can achieve what's in this document. Okay. So, um, can I, please, yeah, go ahead. So, I think in terms of how we're using the document, are you saying so in here somewhere we should be more explicit? about the pacing charts that are going to get done because it I mean you Craig just said he doesn't we don't have the resources to do them K to 12 and every content area especially when you think about 9 to 12 content areas right so um, I I think what you're saying is as the, the you know this document has very detailed um, process benchmarks and we should just make sure that the pacing, if there's something around pacing here, that we're, that it's explicit about what can really realistically be accomplished by the end of 2019. What gets, a, you know, the, that there's some mm -hmm. measure, so that there will be some measure of progress this year. And then, you know, there's an expectation of what will be accomplished by um, the end of 2019 school year. I think is that what you're getting at? Making sure that, because I, because actually I don't want to, I the thing that I would, not want to see is, you know, this be interpreted one way, one way by one person. We don't achieve that, and you know, someone is held accountable to something that was never intended to be accomplished, and that well, that's, I don't want possible. to happen. That's exactly my okay. the point I'm, I'm driving at is that you know we we this this document does a lot of things. It structures our interaction with the superintendent. 
Uh, it sets expectations, it, and it's also, I think, for the community. It's a document that should tell the community this is what, as parents and taxpayers, you should expect I think your, your resources to go to. So if, if we want to be explicit in this document, and that's a choice, we don't have to, this is an extremely explicit document, but in, that, in terms of being very granular, that's okay, but that granular, that, that need, we need to not just talk about the focus areas where we're going to prioritize, which was very helpful to have five, and I like that, but we also have to talk about to the extent we have something very specific in here, like a pacing chart, and there are other examples in these benchmarks, if we can't do them or we're not going to, we, we need to readjust expectations, amend this document so that the member of the public looking at this can say, oh, you know, it said pacing charts, but now it's just going to see something different. And I'm just picking that as one example because it is very explicit and it is up front and it's been there for a while. Yes. So, Mr. Robinson, at the mid-cycle review, yeah. I will revise based on what we feel we can do and can't do. Okay. So, and I will show that, nope, this is not realistic. We have adjusted it. And any redlining would be helpful in that. So people know what was changed. So I will revise it at our mid-cycle review. Okay. Yeah, I just want to, it was a question I had as I was reading it. Is this assuming existing resources or is this assuming something else? So I would share those concerns and I think that's a great solution. Jeff. Yeah. Thank you. When is the mid-cycle review? After? February. February. February, so still before April. Okay, so, but we'll be through the budget. So that's a good time to revise it once we'll, we'll have a good handle on that. I, I think it's also important to really understand this document is the document that is it's primarily, I mean, it's for us, it's our district improvement plan, but it's used as a driver mm -hmm. for action within the district by the superintendent and his staff. And I, I think we've, I think we error on being sometimes uh, providing too much data and information. I'm a little, I'm a little wary of, I don't want to, um, I don't want to ask Dr. Darty to change this document to make it something that we put in the public versus this is the document that helps him manage day to day. So I think we just we have to be sure that it's accurate, but in my mind I'm also saying, you know, I don't know. We, the more we share with people and the more detail, then you have to really worry about, you know, every single tiny little word because it's going to be dissected. And that sometimes distracts from using the tool to accomplish the work. Like, it, this is a tool to help make sure that they accomplish the work that we want done. So I, it's just a struggle, I think, at this point. I, I agree that it's a struggle. I like um, Mr. Boivin's suggestion in that remembering repeatedly how hard it is to do that evaluation of the superintendent at the end according to goals that no longer were necessarily realistic, but always good. And so if they, as you're suggesting, Ms. Webb, that we keep the goal, but it gets qualified by what might be possible. So if the pacing charts are the goal, and then we say with at least X number with progress in it by the time of an evaluation, as opposed to the expectation that 24 would be done, because I think there's also a different plane that we're talking about. As we've heard many times from Mr. Martin, these pacing charts are developed by the teachers, and the teachers are pacing their developing of the pacing charts, as far as I'm understanding it, so that those pacing charts aren't going to be get the seal of approval until they feel they're useful enough. So they're trying, they're piloting, right, what they're yeah. doing. I mean, I feel like I want to clarify some of our terminology. You know, when I say a curriculum document, that essentially uh, we chose to create curriculum documents for math and ELA in K-5, thinking it would be the, the largest leverage points to sort of propel our progress. Because we realized as the state had shifted their standards, I'll kind of connect to what Principal Ippolito was talking about before, that we were also purchasing new programs Right, whether that be math and focus or no atom or whatever it is. Um, and that we realized that sometimes we were talking about things as if they were the same. We would talk about the state framework standards. We would talk about our curriculum 
and we would talk about some resource like math and focus like they were all the same thing and they're different things mm -hmm. We felt that actually making sure that we had curriculum documents outlined that basically say in this district, these are the standards that we are teaching to, right? Um, this is what we feel that students should be able to demonstrate to show that they understand that, um, which is a little bit different than the framework standards. It's a little bit different than saying the program that I'm just turning the page and going to the next page in the math book or whatever the, the program is. Um, and I think that gets to what they were talking about in the last presentation, is that they, because it's less about what resource or what curriculum you use, but it's about where you're calibrating your expectations. What, do ki what are kids accustomed um, to doing on a daily basis, and how do they apply their understandings? How do they apply their knowledge? And that's what's how we're going to see the different results mm -hmm. um, with kids, and that's what we have done for many years, but the fact that all of these standards are changing at the same time and again, it's not a complaint, it's not an excuse, but I've, I've joked before that when I talk to other districts and, you know, I'll meet their middle-level STEM coordinator or whatever, I always say, oh, I hate you. You know, because it means that, that their job is to simply focus on math, science in grades 6, 7, 8, and that's all. Um, and we haven't had those sorts of documents, nor do we have the sorts of layers of support that help us in times of change. And as, as I think Dr. Doherty was saying, these are times of pretty ex extreme change, all of which I think is great. It's the way Massachusetts became number one in the country and will stay number one. Number one. Mm -hmm. um, but as he was saying, I do think it puts a lot of stress on our teachers, um, our, our, on our staff, our leaders. The pacing charts or guides are really just sort of an overview, which sort of gives recommendations to staff, which has to be, I mean, that really is a teacher document, is basically how do I kind of fit this all in in a year? Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a little heightened focus on those several years ago with the new math program and with the level three thing to think, were some people not getting done? Was it where's their variation from school mm -hmm. to school? And we realized, no, we needed structures to make sure teachers were communicating about this and realized that um, what it meant to actually go through the entire curriculum. There's no one right answer to a pacing chart. I mean, even with great documents, you will have teachers that will make very informed decisions about saying, I'm going to take a little longer on this because the kid's in front of me, but I've got a plan for how I'm going to make that up or integrate it the next thing. So it's not something that should be followed as if it's carved into stone, but they're guidelines, they're recommendations. Um, so there's no question, I mean, that work is very time consuming. It's a lot easier when you have somebody whose job it is simply, I mean, I've spoken to other people in other districts who have said, um, actually one of our principals who used to, yep. you know, she had said, when the standards changed, their team of directors, all they did for a few months was sit together and write documents. Um, we, we just don't have that sort of luxury. That's the downside. The upside, if there is an upside, is it has to involve our staff very, so very so directly. So when the, when the uh, mid-cycle review will then know or have a better idea on the resources available mm -hmm. and put out the document mm -hmm. that, that aligns I'll with make I'll make have. adjustments. And I don't, I, I understand what you're saying about putting qualifiers in there, but I don't, I don't, I don't know whether I like that idea that, uh, you know, you know, it kind of says, well, if we have more, we can do this. It's just we need to just say what we're going to do and do it and not, well, we could do this, but we need more. I just don't think that should right. be part of this. That's just my opinion. Uh, right. But the update in February will reflect sort of where we are. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess my reaction to that was related to what Ms. Webb said in that this is this document that the district improvement plan is a road map. So we don't want to put uh, end of roads on something that we might be able to accomplish. So we're still aiming for all the pacing guides, but it won't be necessarily realistic to have them all done. So that's the qualifier I was saying, that we'll get at least something done. But um, why don't we just say what we're going to do and do it, and uh, rather than say, right. well, maybe we'll be able, we'll do this and maybe we can do that. I just, that's just, I guess we just agree to disagree <laughs> on that. But. 
I think it has to do with the, the timing. I mean, those these have to happen. I might use the term curriculum documents instead of pacing chart because that kind of denotes a very specific type of document still has to be there. They have to be there. And they're, in many cases, they're in the hands of teachers and they're using them, they're piloting them. Um, so I don't think the goal changes. I think when it's actually done and published, it might change. It might be a year later than what we think, but the work is ongoing. I also have said, and the, the teachers understand this, that it's not as if it's ever done. That's one of those ongoing things. Curriculum documents are re reviewed annually. You know, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and so I think that that's an important thing to remember as well. Yeah. So just to close that one point, and then I have a separate question moving through the documents. But so just on page one, right, I'm not thinking on pacing charts. You, you have four goals. You have four focus areas in your goals here, A, B, C, D, right? I, I didn't write this document. I'm just reading it. It says A and D are to focus energy. I think that the clear priorities we heard tonight are an example of that. B and C, literacy and math, say improve literacy instruction, improve math instruction with a whole bunch of things that end with pacing chart. So just redline it and whatever is you think is realistic for 2018, the committee will discover, discuss and, and we'll align on that when, mm -hmm. when we get to mid-year. Mid um, the, the second point, page five was the next place I was gonna go. I wanna be clear about what these goals are and what they're not. As, as I read this document, it strikes me that the goal is to engage in a set of actions or activities that start you know, really on the top of page six and go on for quite some time, right? And the reason I say that is because we have measures towards progress of our goal during the next three years, and we're in year two. And then it says, before we have A through E, we have, we should see progress in the following areas. Should see, right? It doesn't require progress. It just says we should see it. And I, I summarize these a little different. We have increases or decreases in assessments. We have increases in access. We have what I call student events in Part D, students showing up to school or not, things about student surveys, things like that. Participation of teachers. And we have data and surveys. What would be helpful when we get to the mid-year, whenever that's going to happen in February, is to understand what assessments are we progressing on. So we saw some data tonight from you know, a, you know, one school, one assessment, we also heard that it's not necessarily comparable to previous MCAS assessments. So I guess my question is for the committee, just to be clear on what is the superintendent being assessed on here and what is he not being assessed on so that we're all having the same set of expectations. So is it any, just to take an example, a decrease in the achievement gap, does that mean that if any subpopulation of students has a reduced achievement gap in any of the nine schools, that that is, uh, that is a goal achieved? I don't know from reading that. And then lastly, if we move to all the, there's well over 100 of these things when I counted them. It's 140 or so if you add them all up. Um, what we call benchmarks, and some of these, these are all activities. And, and it's good that we have individuals assigned to them and we have, we have dates assigned to them and we have status assigned to each of these. It's very granular, as I said before. Are we, are we grading the superintendent on having completed at the end of next year all these things? <coughs> And then the question is, if, if there's a date on here that ends this year, is, is our assessment criteria that we hold the superintendent to that date? Or is it something different that we just say at the end of next year, um, we, we complete all of these action items? So that's, I, I just like some clarity around, I wasn't here when these were, were drawn up, and I wasn't here for all the discussions back and forth. I've been part of some of the assessment discussions recently, but what's our understanding of what assessments and, and how do we measure assessments and access under page five? And is the goalpost for the superintendent anything that's marked end of 2018 should be complete by the end of 2018? Is that the criteria here? Is it something different? Because I don't understand it. I guess it was. Uh the way I've always understood these on page five, this is sort of the, this is the, the overall, these are going to be the areas that we're going to measure progress. And then as we look at the, the monitoring pro or the process benchmarks, um, you know, those are the specific items. So um, in terms of, you know, 
the closing the achievement gap item A dot A, you're 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 not that's you gotta look to these details to see where that data is, right? So um, and it, for the most part, you're, you, we've always been judging sort of where we are on that progress in the three-year goal. I do see um, on page six, there's one that basically only right now it has um, it has a 2016-17 school year, um, but I don't think that's that's not a completion point. Cool. So that 2016-17 was um, perhaps when the this this structure was put in place, but it's in process, so the completion is out through 2019. John, I don't know if you can maybe just clarify with those examples. That's on page six. So can I can I talking about this? Yeah. One can, year? can I can I speak more globally? Yeah. yeah. I want to direct you to the educator plan overview. Because this is the district. And I apologize that I probably should have started with the cycle for you, Mr. Boyvin. Because this is the process that every superintendent in the state uses. Right, it's, it's actually the, the cycle that every educator in the Commonwealth it's uses. In the educator plan. The actual educator plan, there is right. a five step cycle. And I'm going to talk about this when we talk about the goal piece, my goals. Yeah. So there is a self assessment piece, which I have gone through. The actual rubric, I went through each element of the rubric to see where I felt I was as a superintendent. And I will share with you where, what I thought. From that, goals are being developed. That's what's happening this evening. What I am getting evaluated on at step five, which is the summit of evaluation, is the one goal in the district improvement plan, which is listed, and the two goals that I have here in my educator plan. There is a rubric that you also complete <coughs> each year as part of the sum of evaluation, which I provide a lot of evidence for you to use that connects to those different areas. I do, as part of that, show the different measures of progress. I provide more data than not so that people can actually see there are some areas we may do better in, there's some areas we may not. So that's how the process works. That's the way the process is defined by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So we're goal setting tonight, is that your understanding? <clears throat> that's what you're approving tonight is the district improvement plan and the superintendent's goals. I have a question. Sure I don't know if this is helpful, but in thinking through your question, Mr. Bob, and I felt like there were two areas. One was where the goal isn't very specific. So improvement in closing the achievement gap in literacy, right? That isn't a specific X percent of this population. It's general. Like Dr. Doherty said, he provides us with a ton of data and information. And my experience has been it's been a pretty back and forth process. So there have certainly been instances where I look for the data and say, you know what I'm really interested in is this. And then I'll go back and say, could you provide me with X, Y, and Z? So I don't know if that helps. But that sounds like it comes later in the process. I mean, I did, yes. I, just like Ms. Webb's question answered, you have a 2016 17 school year um, benchmark here. It says in process, but we're past the 2016 17 school year. So what's going on? On page six of the district improvement, John, just as an example. Yep. So is our, is, what's our goal here? What are we doing tonight? Like, are, are we just saying, look, anything that's overdue, you need to finish? And anything that's due at the end of this year, you need to finish? And when we get to 2018, the only things that are left will be due the end of 2019. Is that, is that what we're doing? I'm not sure how the committee wants me to proceed. I, I have given you a very detailed district improvement plan I am going to put forward, after this discussion, two goals which I feel are important. I've given you a context to this evening, a very detailed context of where I've been reflecting on. So I leave it up to the committee to decide how you want to proceed. Well, I would propose two very clear goals from the last two weeks for me, but I don't know where they fit here, although I could put them in various places. 
John, can I, can I just, I just want to clarify, like on page six, my way of understanding this, and I know in the past, if I look at that goal, because that's about um, ensuring that students who require additional intervention services are able to access tier one curriculum instruction with the general education classroom at least 80%. So that's not a goal. Uh, sorry. It's an action step. And I think that's what people, there's only one goal in this district improvement plan. That's it. There's one goal. Which is closing the achievement gap. That's the goal. District goal for 2016-19 school year is to ensure the success of all students over the next three years. The Reading Public Schools will increase student engagement, improve achievement, decrease discipline referrals, enhance parent community, community two-way communication. Mm -hmm. Does that mean there will be no achievement gap at the end of 2019? Improve achievement. What does that mean? It doesn't mean there's going to be no gap. It means that it we're says, going to get better. It says it close the gap. To... Closing means we're closing. closing the gap, yes. It doesn't mean it's going that there'll be no gap. It means that we need to be making really good progress on it, like those student growth uh, percentile numbers showed that that's part of making good progress. What I'm, what I'm struggling with is it seems that we have open-ended goals that are relative, right, improving, et cetera. Closing to me, I close the door, I close the door. It's not open anymore. So maybe I, I just have an understanding. But improving is, if we wanted to say improving, that's acceptable, of course. Um, but what I struggle with is that as I read through this document, it all seems to funnel down to these action plans and that we have a series of overdue action items. So what are we going to do about that? Are we just going to change the, the date? Or are we going to say, for, for Ms. Webb's example here, which, which is a good one, uh, it seems that every year you should be achieving this, right? So we could say, did you achieve it in the first year? Did you achieve it in the second? Did you achieve it in the third? But I just want to know what is the criteria that we're going to be providing in sufficient clarity so that everybody knows what instruction we're giving? Is it just to get complete status on all of these benchmarks on pages six and following? That's, that's very clear, except for the fact that some of these are overdue or need to be updated. Or is it something different? I can suggest some other things if that's appropriate here. But for right now, just working within the document. I don't understand how to use this. I, I just think back to Jean's example, though, the, in terms of assessing the goal. So if we look at the goal to close the achievement gap, to improve student achievement, the way that that gets evaluated, we, we can't set out goals for every school and every grade level. But all that data gets looked at. So at the end of the, at the mid-cycle and at the end of the year, we, we look at that data. And John provides all that data along with his self-assessment and, you know, all, all of the information for us to look at. And it's up to us to assess that. Now, we have to look across the whole, whole entire district and overall assess whether we've made progress with that. And, you know, hopefully we have the resources and we, can, we will do that. Um, but I don't think we can, um, you know, this, these process benchmarks are really, they, they are the processes that John and the, and the administration, administrative team and the teachers are using to get to the goal of closing the achievement gap and improving student performance. So if, the, if these are processes are, you know, well identified and well linked to the goal, right, then accomplishing the processes should help us get that result, that goal. I just think, I think maybe oh, in the mid-cycle review, there may, there may be a few of these here, John, that need to be, you know, extended out to 2019, the ones that are in process. The, the, I mean, I may, I did a quick count. I came up with two that are, that need to have a date change. Uh, that's, that's Good. not bad. No, it's uh, not bad. If you compare what I presented to you last yeah. June yeah. to this, there has been significant progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm no, I, I I'm just, just that's so why. So maybe I'm, we back up and just, you know, talk about those and change, you know, just, you know, or not at this meeting, but put an out well, a different date on those couple few that are, to your point. Uh, either we measure, we, either we take a measurement. And then we measure a change and we take a second measurement, whatever that is. It could be an assessment, it could be attendance numbers, it could be anything, right? And then we say, this is what it was at the beginning of the year, this is what it was at the end, goal met, goal not met. Or we set objectives that are process-oriented. We engage in this activity this many times in this way, and if we do that 
to, to Ms. Webb's point, if we, if we engage in that activity successfully and many of these goals have that approach, then we have met the goal. And so if, if that's the approach we're taking, then in, in some of these process benchmarks, there are both kinds of process benchmarks are in here, right? There are some that are process oriented, engage in this process, and then it's complete when that process has been completed. Others of these are very specific if you go toward the end where you have some of these process benchmarks that 100% of administrators using math power standards with new staff, right? That's, that's very objective either, if you can measure that. And so what I'm saying is just, is the goal for the superintendent to complete this checklist, these action items, and do it, and we evaluate on a yearly basis, but we have a set of goals here that are now, you know, we have two years to do. So is, is it, do we just want to update the dates and say that if, if everything that has a 2018 uh, date on it is complete by the end of this school year, then, then that is meeting the expectation here. Is that, as a committee, what our expectation is? No, I just the, want to be clear. No, the expectation, the, the goal is, it, the goal is around a, the achievement result, right, is around closing the achievement gap, the performance, the student outcomes, around all of these other things that are, you know, in, on the first page, that if we just if we achieve the process benchmarks, we should do that. We want to make sure that that happens, but it we still have to look at all the data of the results, right? So, what if we achieve the process and don't get the data that I, we want? Is that is that meeting the standard? No, that'll be reflected in the the evaluation because that's part of the goal. That's the goal. Okay. Yes. I was just going to say, I mean, I feel like I want to speak for the entire leadership team and say I think what may be relevant here also is what's the objective really of the district improvement plan mm -hmm. and I don't feel that any of them look at it to say we need to create a very clear document or rubric with which the school committee can evaluate the superintendent that's not what we're talking about at all I think there's a process for that and how, how much progress we all make on that um, the superintendent has his own goals but ultimately, they look at this document and they said, this is what we want to achieve for kids, period. Mm -hmm. And it's important, whether it takes one year or five years or six years. I almost think it's our own liability that we have a lot of educators in our district that will say, no, this is, no matter what happens, no matter how many cuts happen year to year, we're not going to let it show. We have to keep making sure that we're making progress towards those goals. Um, and so when some things are not taken off, because it would be very easy to tighten up a document and say, you know what, we can't do that anymore. Um, but in my conversations with our leadership team or with staff in this district, that's not how they think. It's just not. But they again, said, I go back to we got to do, say what we're going to do and do it. Now, if it, if it means pushing something out, uh, then let's it's about do the that. Time. I, I, have, I have pushed some things out in this And I'm document. not saying, yeah, I'm just, but, we, you know, we can't, you know, if, if there's a few things that were. Yeah, it's just get, a few. Didn't get, and that's only a few. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that just say 2016 And no one's saying, you know. Don't do it. Yeah. You know, no one's screaming, yelling about, let's just change the date and so that, and then come back and look at you know when we, when it can be done by like, and I do think it's uh, you know you know I do think that you know while we're looking at this document it is part of, of the you know you do look at this when you do the evaluation to see you know these are the things that uh, you know we completed or didn't complete so it's, it is it is the the goal uh, but it's also this as well I mean I think that that was your question, right? Do we look at this uh, in this conjunction with the? With so it sounds like it's part of our analysis, but it's not all of it. That that that's the way I. When am. when you do the sum of evaluation of of any educator, whether it be the superintendent or a classroom teacher, um, there are two. If you may remember this from last year, there were essentially two ratings that you give. The first rating is the progress towards your goals. So I can't remember the exact Which is this. descriptors. Right. right, the district improvement plan and the superintendent's goal. So that's one rating. Right. The other rating is where is the overall summative rating based on each standard. Right. Standard one, two, three, four. And where you feel by indicator 
and you gave you gave ratings of exemplary proficient needs improvement or um, unsatisfactory so that's the two ratings that you give any educator with this evaluation system right, right. So and both and we look we use all of this correct this to do that and the evidence that I provide for you helps you get to that point plus I hope all of the observations that you have had of me as superintendent both at school committee meetings and in other venues it should be part of that data yeah and it and it's certainly it's certainly the prerogative of a committee member to in their evaluation say you know these things didn't get mm -hmm. absolutely and either have a conversation with you as to why uh, and you know come to your conclusion at that point you know. okay. so. Yes. I, I think that the piece that is clear is under these A through E. It doesn't. I'm sorry. On page five, it doesn't say these. The um, action plans are individual stars in the sky that we're aspiring towards. And under A through E, it says a decrease in the achievement gap on state and local. It says an increase in students. It says. And it's clear, I think that we're not talking about doors, we're talking about people. We're talking about students in a changing dynamic with resources that are inadequate. So, that my opinion. So, um, it's not, it's on a continuum. It's not, in 2017 it was supposed to be done that we ensured all students got them well were there many many more that did and that's the data we'll get if he's not if it's not quite a hundred percent if it's not the eighty percent then we need to know understand why and make a decision in relation to the goal yep. but there's we're a part of this evaluation as much as what's being done as well as the changing landscape in which it's happening, which is, I think, part of what we got in the introduction to this. I understand what you're saying, and I think it's partially, you know, when you come at things from a statistical point of view, a more quantitative view of the world, then things get nice and clean, and you can parse them that way. But I'm not sure we're working in that kind of an environment that can be parsed so cleanly as to say, okay, reach, 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 reach. But we can see the progress that we've made, how it's been made, what's happening in the direction we're going in. And those are all the subjective elements that go into the evaluation. That's my. Yes. No, so I think that's helpful. What I, what I take away from the discussion uh, that we just had is that the district improvement plan, that's all we're talking about at this point, uh, has a number of different um, it has guidance for the, for the district on, on various levels, right? It has some, a district goal, which is kind of very flexible, we'll call it, abstract, but important. And then it has, in this chart that you were pointing to on page five, um, was, was a, it, it, I think it illustrates this well, right? We have, we have a goal, we have action plans uh, in, in this, and then an educator plan that we'll come to later. So, there's three parts in my mind, right? There's, there's the goal, which, which I just talked about. There's on page five a series of um, you know, progress benchmarks or, or I think we just say areas of progress that we would expect. Some of those are quantitative, some are not. Uh, and then there's a series of very detailed, we call them benchmarks here, but I would call them activities starting on page six and goes on for several pages. And so those are all different facets or different components of a document that's designed to align effort within our district, right? And so we're supposed to be on this map, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever we're talking about, whatever we're getting updates on, whatever we're asking for budget for, it's supposed to be on this map, right? And so what I'm saying is, whatever we put on this map, when we have changed circumstances like resources, we made some assumptions going into we meaning the committee, I wasn't part of it, but when this was laid out three years ago, two years ago, Certain assumptions, we've changed those. We need to update the map to make sure that in the pacing charts, which is one example I picked on, but there are many in here that you could point to and just say, you know, we're being realistic in terms of prioritizing and letting taxpayers, parents, educators, staff know where we're going as a district, what activities we're investing in, 
and how we're prioritizing those activities. And so if the circumstances change, I, th I just think for everybody involved in this process, it is important to update this document. And I know we do, but I want to make sure that it stays up to date. And then if we're making changes to redline them, I think is helpful so that the public can see where we've made adjustments and changes. They can hold us accountable as, as the ones who are helping author this plan as elected officials. So they have a voice in, through us in that process, and they have a voice as parents through the superintendent. So. I just want to be, and, and, and when we do evaluations, this is, you know, we're all going to take our own approaches to that, but we should take approaches within this document, yep. right? This is the, this is the document we've agreed on, so. So we'll, uh, at the February date, potentially clean this up and, uh, relative to re available resources. Right. Is okay. that... Yep. And the, the other That's what I, I had mentioned earlier. Yeah. Okay. So can I, if I can just try one more stab at an example? Because, so I think one of the items in here is to conduct a review and make recommendations of the K-12 language-based special education program related to services. And I believe that part of one of those, that act, piece, piece of that activity is Carolyn looking to see about getting maybe some tufts and outside Correct. concern. And that is currently slated for this year. Um, now, if in February it looks like we can't get the funding, I, I, you know, whatever, if that looks like it's not going to happen, hopefully it will, right, but if so, it doesn't, and that might have to be redlined out to 2019, we don't want to see that, but I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, I just don't want all this slip into that last year because we didn't get to it the first two years, and then suddenly we're in the last year of a three-year plan, and it's unrealistic. Right. And then but we, I don't think there's a lot of those. There's uh, only a few of them. I want to yeah. assure the committee that I have been doing that on a regular basis, that, that this is not a stagnant document. Right, if we compare this to the last In one. fact, this year the piece that I added, which Mr. Boyvin did say he appreciated, yeah. was the areas that we are focusing our resources on right. which was good you because know, I knew that last year that that was a concern by the committee so I listened to the committee I updated that piece and I have updated this plan it is not a stagnant stagnant document would one very pointed specific question for the superintendent um, the assessment of student reading levels under Fontes Pinal or whatever the right approach is is that in here, like getting getting a sense of where That's our, the local assessments. That's that's in this document. That's the local assessments. It may have been on a different that are in description. There. It's under um, local assessments. And that and that local assessment, that's specifically. So at the end of this district improvement plan, we should have a good idea how many elementary school students are reading at grade level. Is that a fair yes. statement? Yes. The that is the data that we will be using internally. Yes. Okay, so we'll have that for all five elementary schools. Yes. Good. So when I said clean it up, I wasn't inferring that it was a stagnant document. I meant that we'll have a better understanding of what our available resources will do, just so we don't back anybody into sure. a corner to do something we're not giving them the resources to do. Sure. We want to, um, well, we have a motion. Yeah. No, you, you don't have a motion yet. Oh, because we need Cause to Because I'm not with done the yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the next part. <laughs> Superintendent. I, I stopped at the district yeah, improvement yeah. plan yeah. because okay. I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions. Which is good. <laughs> and now, upon reflection, maybe I should have done my goals first because I should have explained the All process right. better. Um, so in the, in the goal setting process, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, all of the educators in Massachusetts, they, they do a self-assessment. We, we all use the rubric that we get evaluated on at the beginning of the year to take a look at where we think we are. Um, under administrator standards, there are four areas, which you may recall from last year when you did my summative. Uh, those four areas are instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. So as I was doing my self-assessment this year of where I was, um, I realized that based on last year mm -hmm. that I was stronger in management and operations and family and community engagement 
than instructional leadership and professional culture. So what I mean by that is I went through all the elements and I felt that my focus, unfortunately, instead of being in all four areas, it was more on those two other areas and less on the other two. So certainly um, I've learned a great deal based on not just last year, but in the last two years. And sometimes when you learn things, you have to learn it the hard way, which, which I have at times. It's my hope, though, though, that for our leadership team, how to use learning for make us better and for the benefit of our students. So last year, as I've been reflecting, too much of my time was dedicated to bringing a close to the RMHS litigation, which has been hanging over our community since before I entered this role, an override ballot question that was not successful, and a very difficult budget process. Our district suffered because of that focus. Not because these things are not important, but they are, because equal attention was not always given to our priority goals for students. And that's why I feel I was stronger in the middle two and not the outside two. So this year, our entire district leadership team is participating in what is called the Agile Learning Institute, which is being facilitated by John Dioria, who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and formerly of Teachers 21. The purpose of this institute is to provide models, tools, and simulations to help us as leaders manage key elements of organizational culture and develop our own leadership capacity to shape the conditions that impact adult learning. What we do and how we model for our staff has a direct impact on the culture of schools and the district, and this ultimately affects our teachers and students. As part of this institute, each of us is working on coming up with a stretch goal that we can experiment with and publicly announce to our different communities. So you are my different community that I'm mm -hmm. announcing my stretch goal to. And the purpose of this stretch goal is to focus on something that you are truly passionate about and will hope to change the way we are currently doing things. It is also risky because stretch goals can fail. But that's okay because the only way we can learn is by failing. Trying new things, stepping out of our comfort zone, and learning from our mistakes. So the second goal of my superintendent's goals is my stretch goal, which is essentially to better support our leaders, our staff, and our entire community to successfully navigate this time of change in education. Our greatest asset in Reading has always been our teamwork or the willingness to work together to accomplish any goal. And our commitment as a community to our children's future. As I review my goals, I want to highlight the second goal, which is to structure my time to increase visibility and improve communication and messaging with staff, parents, and the community. This will be evidenced by an increased understanding and awareness of our schools and district parent and community members as measured by surveys and other tools. In addition, this will indirectly impact student outcomes because I will be modeling for staff, participating in professional development activities, attending building level meetings, and conducting individual walkthroughs with building principals. Essentially, I'm restructuring my time so that less time is spent on the management and operations piece of the rubric to simplify it, and more on the instructional piece and the professional culture piece. In challenging times like this, it is even more important that as superintendent, I am more visible to staff and community, more involved, and have a greater understanding of the teaching and learning aspects of our schools. We also have to be realistic in that we are all human, and we can only do so much. Our progress will be slower than what we all want. However, we are in education because we want to make a difference in the lives of children. I didn't talk about me when I was talking about the rest of my team, but for those of you that have known me for over 30 years, or less than 30 years, you know that that's why I am in the Reading Public Schools and what I've done over my time here as an educator. At times, the work that we do is exhausting, but at the end, it can be very rewarding. So tonight, after I answer any other questions, I do ask the committee to support the goals 
that I've presented to you this evening. John, can you just oh, I'm sorry, John. Yeah. clarify where the, set the goal, second goal that you referred to? The second goal is the um, professional page, practice goal. Is that page four? Page four. Okay, page sorry. four. Oh, the there whole we go. thing. Yeah, right? yeah. And I then got it's it. all these sorry. action items. Yep. Are all, all 13 action items a part of that? Uh, yes, it is. I also took the feedback from the committee very seriously last year in my evaluation, and you will notice that some of the feedback that was given to me is reflected in here. So goal... So goal two one is essentially to carry out the, the district stretch. improvement plan. Goal two is the stretch goal. That's my stretch goal. I feel that goal one has to happen. That's that's my job. So um, goal two is the stretch goal that I am publicly announcing. Right. So. Yeah. Um, so just working within goal two, I'm looking at the action item. Um, I'm interested in in how you are going to get feedback from teachers. I noticed item five is a focus group with staff. And 11 is a district conducts a student teacher and parent survey on school climate. Mm -hmm. How, how are, and that, that says funded by, I think it says grant after that, number 11 and fall 2017. So what teacher survey are you planning to do? So we are working on a teacher survey right now. There are different ones that exist out there on school climate. Okay. We want to pick one that um, is links student, teacher, and families. So you don't want to pick one from one type of survey to another. You want there to be some linkage so you can see how the questions overlap. Um, one of the surveys that's been done in the past in this district has been the Pride Survey, which is a school climate survey. Our CAS has actually used it um, in the past to, for their grant. Um, and so that would be one of the surveys we could be looking at. There are some others. So we're in the process right now of identifying the survey that we want to administer this um, sometime this fall. Would it be helpful to have a committee discussion when you have a proposal on that? Why? Just wondering. The, the, the survey is being developed by or decided on by... The, the survey would be an existing survey. It wouldn't be something we'd be making. Right, but you're creating. saying, yeah, in terms of who's, who's working on selecting that. Your, yourself, your staff? No, it would be with, with us and, and actually we'd be involving teachers. Teachers. Yep. So in that, our, and our data coach has also been part of the discussion yeah. because we want to make sure that not only is it valid and focuses in all the areas we want, but that it doesn't rely on a lot of back-end work. I mean, sometimes you can get things for little to no cost, but yet oh, you're yeah, putting yeah. a lot yeah. of hours mm -hmm. on the other mm -hmm. end to be able to really make sense of it all and de So do they, do they uh, so the I'll just use the, the example pride, you said, do they administer it? And it's a, it'd be an online survey. Mm -hmm. So, so you would have, you could have students do it in a controlled setting and then staff could do it and the community, you'd send it out. Um, I, I, I don't think we need to get into the detail of that. I think that we need to trust John, the administrators, the teachers, they're going to come up with that tool. And, and certainly the results will be shared. And the hope is, is that we do this annually. That's why you want to pick you know, a survey that you're going to use for several years. The Pride has been around for a while now. Um, in terms of your other question, uh, I actually did this last year too with the focus groups. I did meet with staff last year several times, mm -hmm. particularly as after the override, mm -hmm. because the, the over because I just wanted to gauge where people's heads were at and to hear from different staff what was going on. Well, and I plan on doing that again this year. Just two questions about the survey: Would it be anonymous, and would there be any benchmark for participation, percent participation before it was closed? Uh, it definitely would be anonymous because it would be online. Mm -hmm. um, so they wouldn't have to enter any identifying information. I mean, certainly we would want to do everything possible to get a large participation rate. Okay. So, <coughs> some, I mean, I, the 
probably the shorter the, the better to get that participation rate, correct? Yeah, for the, the window, yes. You, you don't want no, something. No, no, no. shorter survey. Yeah. Uh, oh, shorter survey, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Something yes. Something that will take 15 minutes, not an hour. Yeah. Right. Um, with with um, open-ended, an opportunity for open-ended feedback? Um, I, I not I don't want to say yes because I'm I'm not sure I have to look, I have to look at what they can offer. Mm -hmm. um, I Nick has so actually changing gears is it is it on survey because I'm going somewhere very different next. <laughs> so anything um, else on no, that was topic? Different. Okay, it was different. I'm going to take a complete left turn here. Um, looking at communication, which is in goal one. So just to connect a dot from unfortunately Carolyn's not here this week, but. Um, so Carolyn gave a very good presentation both last week and, and then two weeks ago talking about um, one of the, the, the Office of Civil Rights review, the response to that in the settlement agreement, but also the Massachusetts Mid-Cycle Review. I think that was two presentations ago. And there were five, I believe there were five areas where we were working toward compliance uh, on the Mid-Cycle Review from the state of Massachusetts. Four of those five areas I noted dealt with communication to parents or to students. So I would include that meeting those goals that by the dates that we specified as part of communication action planning. I don't know that those, Th those, those would be more of Carolyn's goals and that nope. would be. Nope. No, I can only assess one person in the whole of Reading Public Schools and that's the I assess I assess the director of student services. And I, we do not assess that person. We assess only the superintendent. And part of the superintendent's goals in communication is to make sure that the district is meeting the requirements of Massachusetts state law, which includes four of those five areas that Carolyn had. She was the one who delivered the message. But what I'm saying is that compliance with that measure, compliance with the law, is part of how I understand communication and action and plan e. So I, I will leave that up to the committee because I, I, I'm not I, sure that that's. I think that's part of the district. That's in, yeah. in item E of the district, which is the district improvement goals. That's part of what she as student services director for the district is responsible for. And um, just like the just like a the process benchmark that's in there about getting the assessment done uh, about the LLD program by Tufts, I mean, maybe that would be, that may be among some of those process benchmarks, or it's just really, it's part of the goals um, around closing the achievement gap, um, and prop, and I don't know whether that's in social emotion or, or in literacy, but in specifically in communication, I don't think it belongs there. I think it belongs in the district improvement plan, if anywhere, but it would probably be, could be in the, process benchmarks. I think if it affects the district and it's a matter of compliance with the law, we as a committee, in my view, are responsible for making sure that we provide and assess the superintendent on that criteria, compliance with the law. His whole job is compliance with the law, Nick. Everything I completely they agree. Do. I, so, but that's so, a district goal. He, he, and that is goal, actually understand it to management and operations that standards. there is a whole indicator on making sure that I follow the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Communication. So that could be part of the summative rating that you give me for that indicator. Under management. That is as under part management, of management and, and operations. operations. There is a specific indicator on law. Yes. That I am following the law. And what I'm saying, as I understand communications action plan E on page three, goal number one, it says communication between parents, community, and schools, as evidenced by survey and other data. The other data, in my view, includes meeting the deadlines we talked about two meetings ago for the Massachusetts Mid-Cycle Review on or before those dates. The superintendent is free to staff who he would like and delegate that responsibility and hire an excellent you team to do it. But he you is are, ultimately responsible. I think you're completely wrong on that, and you're going you're going into a place that school committees don't belong. It, you could say here he is responsible to assure that his staff achieves the goals that they need to achieve and accomplishes what they need to achieve. And I don't feel like I don't even feel like that needs to be explicitly stated. We have been through so many presentations on that. We heard a teacher talk today explicitly about what's going on in that bridge program. 
This stuff, if you, if, if that needs to be anywhere, it could be a process benchmark under that, under that category for the district. But what you're asking for is you're asking to take a very specific action that is the responsibility of our director of student services, elevate it to the superintendent and put it under his goals. And that is just not appropriate. His goal and what we hire him to do is to provide the leadership team, which he just gave us when he started this, a, an excellent overview of his leadership team. So I, I, I disagree with eyes. that. Yeah, I, I share your concern, but I'm trying to find a way to navigate both desires. I'm, in, I'll give an example of why I share Mrs. Webb's concern with that, with taking a staff member or a group of staff members' goals and elevating it. Let's say, for, for instance, we do have one school that is, is struggling significantly. I would not, not want to see a superintendent's goal that focused on that school mm -hmm. because he's got nine schools that he needs to oversee and we can't get so fixated on one issue that we lose the forest for the trees. So I think I like the district goals to talk about improving student, account, uh, student outcomes across all student populations and across all buildings. So that would be an instance where I don't think it would be appropriate to say, well, you know what, we're really concerned about this school or this grade level, so we're going to make your goal to deal with that specific thing, because I think it's too narrow for a superintendent. He, so I, I share your concern. I'm wondering, though, if in a solution is, is that evidence that, that we could request during the evaluation process, Dr. Doherty? Could we say, um, can we get an update on yeah, where we're, we're at with, with process on these five goals we heard? Well, you'll get it from Carolyn. Yeah. Because Carolyn will be giving you updates throughout the school year. Exactly. So if it's evidence that you care passionately about in terms of, and, and to your point, there is a specific indicator. There is. Where we, we say, to what extent does a superintendent mm -hmm. understand and follow the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? And every committee member has the opportunity to say whatever those, and, you know, above and beyond, or yes, not really, or whatever. Exemplary proficient needs Thank improvement. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't done uh, it in six unsatisfactory. months. Unsatisfactory. Yeah. So, <laughs> You know, in order for you to evaluate him on that standard, you might need that evidence. And I would agree with you, actually. I don't know that it needs to be a goal. Mm -hmm. For me, the distinction is that we've had both federal and state oversight for noncompliance with the law, whether that related to some subset of activities that were specific to one geography or another within the district. To me, those some of those that oversight relates to communication. And I don't think it's unreasonable to hold the one person that this committee is responsible for evaluating, responsible for making sure we follow the law, regardless of where that takes us. He is responsible in every way, shape, or form, not just so, from an OCR complaint. I think, if, I think, I agree with Ms. Borowski. We have, it is part of the process, and it doesn't need to be explicit. It already has been made explicit. We know that. She's going to report on it. It's going to be reported to us. It will be part of all of the information that we use, the, the enormity of information that we use to evaluate the superintendent. I, I disagree. I think it's, it, is, it undermines his ability to lead his team. It undermines the overall district view of the administrative so, team and so it's what, unnecessary what what are you nick what are you actually you're asking that that this goal or this action be rewritten to what are you asking for that 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 you can't if you don't like something can't write in your narrative in your end of your evaluation no, I mean, there's obviously differences in how we interpret this document, and that's all I'm pointing to. I'm not asking anybody to change their mind. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm simply... So if you're, if you're, I guess my point is if, if, if when you do your evaluation of the superintendent and you're unhappy with, with you know, the way he managed one of his uh, direct reports, you're certainly able to write that in your narrative summer, summer, summary of, of Yeah, I mean, that's not what I started by saying, nor was it what I was thinking. I mean, I was just Well, then pointing, I misunderstood. I, yeah, I mean, to, to clarify what I said initially, and I, and, and I haven't well, I changed my view of this. You, you were I, talking about. No, I was just saying, I understand communication to include the following. Yeah. Right, communication to parents whether, whether someone else is, is responsible directly for that or, you know, in my view, 
communication to parents includes complying with the Massachusetts Mid-Cycle Review results as it, results to, as it relates to communicating information to parents and students about their IEPs. That's, that's part of that E, communication in goal one, in my view. I was just expressing that view with an interest in seeing how other people on the committee viewed it. It appears we have different views. That's all I wanted to understand, and I think this has been very helpful. Jane. I don't need to rewrite anything here. I'm not proposing that. Yeah, and I, I think well, I, I did. where there may be disagreement is where in the process do you address it? So does it need to be written as part of the goal? Does it come during the prep? But I, I, I did not sense anyone, well, I won't speak for anyone else, but I certainly agree that compliance with the um, mid-cycle review um, benchmarks is, is absolutely critical. So I don't disagree with you on that. I just yeah. don't know that it needs to be written into the goals well, as a specific thing. Because there's because we are going to have ac we will have access and I, I yeah. suspect many of us will use it as part of our evaluation. Look, I, so that's where the disagreement is not on whether or not it matters. I think it clearly oh, matters. Oh, I, 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 where I think in violent agreement, all of us, if that's the right term, <laughs> that we all no. feel passionately about what's best for students, and I don't think any of us differ on that. I don't think anybody in this room differs. Um, I think we all want the same outcomes. I was merely pointing out on a night that I understood to be dedicated to articulating what are the goals how I understood and read this particular goal, and that's what started this discussion, right? I was just saying, look, I read this goal to include something that apparently there's a, a variety of opinions on, but I understand, I was trying to clarify how I view a goal. I still feel that way. It's just not shared by the committee, fair enough, but I think it's, it's good and healthy for us to express how we understand these goals so that we're literally on the same page when we go through this process and understand where we're aligned and where maybe we have differences. Can I yes. clarify? I'm sorry. We're talking about E and A under that, right? Improved communication between parents. That's what I was asking about. I think that encompasses a lot of things. Yeah. And so that's only one of them. At the CPAC meetings, the parents are very adamant about not just zeroing in on one school or one aspect or one special need. They want all of the children to be considered and there are not all of the children this not in compliance of the law it needs to include the positive parts too I don't disagree so narrowing it down and it also has to include gen ed and families in general so narrowing down just to one aspect that's actually under the jurisdiction of someone else but is part of the big picture. Narrowing it down, I think we lose a lot. Nothing I said should be viewed as narrowing anything. I said include, and what I meant was include. So I completely agree that there's a very wide range of interpretations of that, which is exactly why I made, was trying to make the point that I did. We should all view that and I think it's good for each of us to view anything in this document from our own perspectives. I think the word improved communicate, words improved communication can mean a lot of things. My point in all this was just to state one thing that I thought it could include that apparently is not an area of consensus. But I think it's much broader. I agree with everything you said with that. I'm not sure it doesn't, I'm not sure. We I'm just saying that it discludes, that, unincludes that. Yeah, I, I think I disagree with your assertion that there is a consensus on that. I would agree with what you just said. You don't think it, I, what I heard people, I don't know that it's important. It doesn't I, I think need to be explicitly stated, I think is what we were saying, because it is part, because because Dr. Doherty being compliant with the law, being compliant with all of those things that Carolyn is going after related to this issue or any other legal issue is part of, a part of the bigger processes. It's part of how he, he didn't say he wasn't gonna focus uh, or, or perform the management and operations of the district. He's going to do that. He's going to prioritize some other things over that. But that's all going to get done, and it's it, we all know it's important. It, and it and I think Linda brings a good point out that the the even from the special education parent perspective, um, it's not just those laws. It's all of the law that that drives our public education that we have that we all have to comply to. And Dr. Darty, as the leader and CEO of this district, is ultimately responsible for. So I think it's embedded in the process. I think I think trying to put it there explicitly ha can have some negative impact that we don't want it to have, in terms of 
uh, the leadership of this district and and also the school committee getting too much into the the workings of the superintendent and not staying at the policy level that we're supposed to be at that's why I disagree okay. how about I, I change the topic yeah can, mm -hmm. do you want to do the put the motion on the table or? I'm done thank you yeah. <laughs> I'll put the motion on the table we can continue sure. that discussion move to accept the superintendent uh, and district goals as presented second any other discussion Yes. What does equitable access mean? How do we measure that? Where are you? Where are you? Okay. Is that Page close, two. closing the achievement gap? It is. How do we know when we see equitable access and greater opportunity to access? What tells us that those things have been achieved? It's basically would be looking at our subgroup data for kids, whether that's kids with disabilities, English language learners, perhaps even gender, mm -hmm. and how kids are accessing um, our core curriculum, our different levels of classes. What does that mean? And do that's we feel that it's equitable? Pro, pro, that's a, yeah, so for instance, you know, we talked free. about um, some of our concerns about um, consolidation of the levels, that we wanted to make sure that um, just because a student might have a disability and an IEP does, that, does not mean that that student um, is only able to access the lowest level. Um, and if they are in that level, are they still getting the same expectations, the same core curriculum experiences, so that later when they do have assessments or, or apply to colleges or, or move on to the workplace or whatever, that they still have the same background and training. Um, um, we've looked at things like, um, again, it could be race, it could be gender. We've, we've heard some of the high school, I think, science talk about you know, some of our upper level um, STEM courses, you know, that there's some gender um, inequities. Um, how as a district do we address that? You know, we've talked about that's not just something that you can do in 10th grade, that that mm -hmm. can go back way back into elementary school and how we do that. So um, that's what we mean by equitable access to and, uh, our opportunities for students. How do I know an increase in that when I see it? So if we have existing data that says we only had in the, you know, what used to be, what was the SCP class, that we only had 3% of kids that had disabilities in there, or 5%, I don't know, I'm just making something up. And now we see that that has increased, or that it's doubled. Well, that's obviously that's one thing. you collapse the, the levels. Yeah, I mean, but, are, but are they succeeding? Are they, so then we will need to make sure that they are accessing that content successfully. Um, if we see that we have not had the gender issue that I spoke about. AP Physics. Yeah. Or, or right, we've talked about with the math curriculum, you know, that, you know, we already have more students accessing AP Calculus than we mm -hmm. have in the last 10 years. Um, and we want to break that down to make sure, you know, what's that look like by gender, by, you know, are there kids with disabilities, and all of that sort of information. I think also we just heard from Miss. I'm going to kill her last name. Ippolito. Ippolito. She was saying that just because a child might be um, challenged in one area doesn't mean they can't perform in another area. So kids with special challenges being afforded the opportunity in another area, that's another thing that we can see mm -hmm. through presentations like today. She was recognizing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the challenge to that work, for. as they also was alluded to, is that clearly there are going to be kids that are struggling at some point. Um, to use what you said before, Mr. Bowman, about, I know you used it in a different context, but closing the door, that we don't want to close the door to opportunity for kids. That's why, for instance, the work that we're doing with math at the seventh grade level, that if a student is really struggling, we want to make sure that that pathway that has all those doors open when they get to ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, remain open to them when they're 12 years old. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they're still not going to be struggling, but it means that maybe there's another way to provide the interventions and the supports they need to get them back on track without taking them and putting them into a whole other class, or another group, which would make them, which could make it much more difficult for mm -hmm. them to get back into that path later just because of the way course sequences work. Mm -hmm. So in operation, 
when we we come to the end of the year we adopt this as a goal tonight and we look for evidence of free and appropriate education for all students we look for edu access to curriculum for like, what are we looking for how do we or, or are we just going to wait and see what evidence is presented by the superintendent at the end and and then what kind of narrative is presented along with that and assess whether that evidence meets the narrative that's presented to us. I'm, I'm really struggling with how I'm going to measure an increase. An increase applies, implies to me a starting state and a finishing state and an increase between those two points. So if, the, if we're starting in the beginning of this academic year and we're going to the end of this academic year and we are increasing equitable access, increasing opportunity, I just want to understand what that means. How am I going to measure it? I mean, there are a lot of ways that you've suggested that we could, and maybe, maybe the answer is we're just going to look at a pile of evidence at the end of the year, and everybody in this committee is going to decide for themselves whether that constitutes an increase. So if some, if we've had parents come and talk about leveling of the, um, um, the math curriculum a few times, right? That parent was very concerned, from her perspective, uh, about whether that change in the curriculum constituted an increase in equitable access to curriculum. And maybe it did for one student, maybe it didn't for another student. There are different perspectives, it's just one perspective. But I'm struggling with how, how do I evaluate this? How, how do I, what's our starting state? What's the change we're going to see? And what's the final state? Are we going to count course offerings? Are we going to count, count student enrollment? Nick, the, or is it just whatever we want? Nick, the example that you just gave, you've seen the data. We saw it last year. We've seen it year over year. Um, in regard to the progression of students into higher levels of math and the data. Now, that's every student is an individual, and every student and family has an individual experience from K to 12. But we have to look at what does the data show about what we're doing for students and the number of, of students that we're matric mat uh, matriculating and sticking with being successful at higher levels of math has increased, so that's you know one example. I don't know that we could. That you're right. It is. It's reams and reams of data. Now, um, we have the right as a school committee member, right, to say when we get that data, uh, to say is is that the data that we expected to see. Um, We've seen the data year over year. I think if per perhaps we should, at this juncture, go back and look at the data that was provided last year to say uh, were there pieces missing. I, I I don't I don't know. Maybe from your perspective, there were some pieces missing that would be around that. If you were just talking about equitable access. Well, um, I mean, we know that the we no longer have college prep. We have what strong in a few uh, of the content areas. Yeah, yeah. so it was starting to phase phase, phase it out. Yeah. So that in and of itself is going to give everybody equity because no one's no no one is going to no one will be in college prep anymore, right? I mean, so there. I think I think it's uh, access is to is there. Learning. Is there some other qual you can quality, you can take a look at you could take a look at the number of students use. that are accessing AP courses that are taking the AP exam. Yeah, um, that's that's the next are. level. I'm just thinking. No, you but can it could also satisfy be... that immediately by pointing to the fact that you know now everybody's getting something different now because you're not putting anybody in college prep anymore. Right, so it ensures so that you've already met that everybody's goal. in the everybody's in the right. starting line, or yeah. you know, right. in, the, in the same place. But then we have to <coughs> right. We have to look now. It's how does that marathon get quantum. run? Where are yeah. the different mile mark, you know, mile marks? Um, and do they ultimately finish in a place that they want to? Yeah. But how often do we do YBRS? Is that every year or every, every other year? year. Two years. So we can't evaluate that year to year in Part D. We have to evaluate it over a two years. No, period. but the Pride Survey or something facsimile thereof that measures school climate can be a useful tool. Okay. Um, Motion. 
we have I think you already read the motion. Yeah. Yeah. We seconded. Seconded. It was no, seconded. I know we did. I said that we want to vote on the motion. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I just wanted to say I, I'm really grateful for the thoughtfulness that goes into the planning of this. It takes, I, I can't even conceive where the time comes from, given everything else, on the superintendent and the administrative team's plate to look at this creatively and honestly. And I appreciate that honesty and the openness to I know it's required, but there are ways to approach it. And so the opportunity to discuss it, and I appreciate your questions, Mr. Bovin. I think that we need to look at things critically. So I appreciate this forum, and I appreciate the work that went into preparing these documents. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Favor of the motion. Opposed. Thank you. Set. Motion to adjourn. Oh, so motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor. Aye. <laughs> Five zero. Thank you.